care of you. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, we're going to read innocuous resolutions and not read anything in House resolution by Mr. West expressing sorrow for the passing of John Claude Poor. David. Davis, Ms. Davis, declaring Wednesday is STO Programs Day. Davis asking have sent down the House objection. Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Mr. Rutherford expressing sorrow for the passing of Glorianne Williams, Singletary of Lake City. Mr. Rutherford asking him to send that roll of the house is objection. Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Mr. Magnuson, the passing of William Ed McNeil Jr. Adopted. Go ahead on. Mr. Herb Kurzman. Celebrating the life of Jenny Lavonia Williams Kitty. Adopted. Representative Moore celebrating Goose Creek Girls. Representative Morris and Anderson had to roll the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted. Mr. Garvin honoring Kim Young Woods. Adopted. Mr. Blackwell, remembering and celebrating the life of Luigi Bergamo of Vidalo de Polais, Monche France. Mr. Blackwell, I stand that roll of the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted. Simmerl, Lucas, Dabney. Your council did a great job in the Democratic Party. Uh, he, you he, should he, send him every year. We will. I told we him will. he needs to come every year. He told me to go fly and These are my exact Expressing the loss for the Jack West died of COVID. Adopted. Mayor West celebrating the joyous occasion of the 100th anniversary of Belton Church of God. Jay West asking him to set that roll of the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Mayor West celebrating Belton Honey Path competitive cheer. Representative West asking him to set that roll of the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Bucky Collins expressing deep appreciation for Dr. Helmut Albrecht. Ms. Collins asking him to set that roll of the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered adopted. T Pope. Honoring Clover Girls Basketball. Mr. Pope asked to send that rule of the house. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Rosalind Henderson Myers, Spartanburg South Side Heritage. Senator Henderson Myers asked them to send that rule of the house. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Martin Davis, South Carolina State Guard, congratulations. President Martin asked to send that roll of the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Felder and many others expressing sorrow for the loss of Charlie Powers of York. Felder asked, no, excuse me, adopted. Mr. Rutherford expressing sorrow for the passing of Dr. Reverend Dr. Al Z. Rebecca Chaplin Bishop. Adopted. Melissa Oremus. Heroism of Vietnam veterans. Mr. Ramos, H&M, sent that roll of the house. Objection. Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted.
naming streets and shit. Yeah, we'll, we'll do streets. We'll do that, okay. Yeah, nothing important. Howard Rutherford requesting DOT erect a sign in Richland County in memory of Marvin Heller. For the House Invitations Committee. House Resolution, Velveeta Calhoun. Sorrow for the passing of Benjamin Edward Cottingham of Marlboro. Calhoun asked now sent that roll of the House objection. Hearing none's order adopted. Senate 569 naming a street in Charleston. Invitations. Senate 655 naming a street in Florence. Invitations. 668 Senate naming a street in Nichols. Invitations. Sergeant. Senate 671 declaring Children's Advocacy Center Day. Adopted. Senate 682, congratulating Freddie Mubarak. Stop. Stop it. Senate 683, Senator Michael Bean, congratulating Tony Casey. Adopted. 696 Senator Sessler de destigmatizing substance abuse disorder. <sighs> Invitations. Tell me if you want that. Okay, we have another Senate introduction. It's a concurrent resolution 699 fixing Wednesday, May 5th at the time for electing a member of the Legislative Audit Council. Stop it. We have Senate 701 requesting DOT name a portion of a street. Harvey Middleton Road. Third House Invitations Committee. 707. Congratulating Clay Cato of Lancaster. Adopted. 708. Congratulating Josh. Falconberry. Adopted. 720. Congratulating Dr. Craig F. Rutherford. Adopted. Representative May. Congratulating Paul David Tar Outlaw. President May asked Nancy that had to roll the House. Objection. Hear none. So order adopted. Can you put those upside down so I can keep them in order for you? Flip that stack upside down. Members, when the roll call, all members, please record your presence. When the roll call, it'll be an abbreviated roll call this morning. Please record your presence.
All right, members, if you haven't signed in, please sign in. We're about to get to work. All right, members, we're about to close it. All right, members, we're going to close it. We're going to close it and get started immediately. Mr. Pope, Tommy Pope. All members recorded your presence.
Is there any member of the body who has not recorded their presence? Let me see your hand. If all members recorded their presence. Sit down before I get down. Pose the clothes, clerk and tabulate a quorum is present. Ms. Allison, Ms. Felder. All right, Clerk Reed. Senate 36, or House 3614, Lucas and Allison education favorable as is. Mm, mm. House will be in order. Members, we're going to have a long two days. You might as well get comfortable. If you got a conversation, please take it outside. We're going to go through a lot of bills. Clerk Reed. Thank you. House Bill 3614, Lucas Allison Education, favorable as is. All right, we're on House Bill 3614. We're on the bill itself. Ms. Felder is recognized to explain the bill. Ms. Felder. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, House Bill 3614 by Speaker Lucas and Chair Lady Allison requires high school seniors to complete and submit a free application for federal student aid. Most of us know this as the FAFSA application. There are exceptions for minors. A parent or guardian can sign an exemption. For students 18 years or older, they may sign their own exemption. School counselors may allow students to submit to be exempt if there is a good cause. The State Department of Education will create the waiver form for instructions to fill it out, options for students who do not complete the application. They will develop requirements for districts to report the number of students that submit the FAFSA. The FAFSA is the form that is required to determine eligibility for more than $150 billion, $150 billion in federal student aid, including Pell Grants, federal student loans, and federal work-study programs. Nationally, only 61.2% of graduating seniors complete the FAFSA. In South Carolina, 13 of our districts have fewer than 20% of their students completing the FAFSA. Only two districts have between 50 and 54%. So most of our districts are 25 to 39%, whereas nationally, it's a 61% average. With that, Mr. Speaker, I move for passage. Pending question is second reading on House Bill 3614. Roll calls require an order. We'll vote on the board. Mr. McNair, Pierce McNair.
Time's expired. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. A vote of 99 to 6. House Bill 3614 receives second reading. Clerk will read. Next bill, Allison Lucas, education. Favorable. Amendment number one is the committee report, which they have. And Ms. Felder is recognized on amendment one, the committee report. Ms. Felder. House will be in order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ms. Felder, let me get you some order before I recognize you. House will be in order. Mm. Ms. Felder is recognized on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, House Bill 3590 allows school districts to hire non-certified teachers in a ratio of up to 25% of a school's teaching staff if a certified teacher is not available. Non-certified teachers must have at least a baccalaureate degree in the subject they are hired to teach and at least five years of relevant work experience. Applicants must have the SLED and the background checks just like every other teacher. Districts must register teachers with the State Department of Education and notify the department if a teacher is terminated. The department must provide a report to the General Assembly on the number of non-certified teachers who are hired and in the subject areas they teach. According to SARA, which the Center for Educator Recruitment, Retention and Advancement, approximately 680 teaching and service positions were vacant at the beginning of the 2021 school year. As of February 2021, there were 515 vacancy. This is an increase of over 26%. Uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I move for passage. Ms. Brawley, with a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Ms. Felder, for the explanation of the bill. Um, I understand the need to fill the positions because a lot of them are vacant in rural communities and many of these students are getting long-term substitute teachers. How is this very different from that, a long-term sub? These people are not certified to teach the particular course that they are teaching. So how are we helping students by allowing these non-certified teachers? Well, this would require the non-certified to have a college degree and have work experience in the subject they're teaching. So at least we've got the knowledge there. It also allows a district to offer classes that currently districts are having to cancel those classes because they don't have a certified teacher to teach them. So it allows for the student to have more opportunity to be best prepared for that next grade level. Another part of the bill, as I read it, gave these non-certified teachers, Mr. Speaker, I can barely hear myself. Just a minute, Ms. Brawley. Thank you. Sergeant, I'm gonna need you to help me in the back. Conversations members, take them outside. Ms. Brawley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another part of the bill that I was concerned about allowed these non-certified teachers as much as two years to apply for the requisite certification, which is much more than we typically would allow any teacher to be in the classroom without having even applied for their certification. Again, I. I'm concerned that this bill will allow these non-certified individuals who have no real urgency to get certified to be placed in the most vulnerable school populations. How is that, how are we safeguarding against that? Well, I think we're really looking here as a possible second career 
for a lot of the people in our communities, especially our rural communities. They have great work experience, they have great college experience, but they're not sure they want to be a teacher. They're not sure that they can do that classroom management part of it. This allows them to come in with professional development and with other teachers and coaches to make sure that's their career choice before they make the time and the investment in getting those credentialing. The two years is a very short window because we do want them to continue on and get the credentialing. But the two years, as I understand it, is not the time that's allotted for them to get certified. It's the time that they have to make up their mind if they even want to submit an application. Is that Co not right? Correct. So we are allowing these people who are not certified to have two years of our children's educational experience to make up their mind as to whether they even want to get certified. I, I'm concerned that we're going to put these teachers, these non-teachers, in front of students in very important critical classes, and most of them are going to end up in rural communities that are already struggling to get qualified, certified teachers. And they've got two years to even think about submitting an application. My kid could have gone through seventh and eighth grade in two years. And I think Representative Brawley, and I appreciate your concern here, we kind of looked at the charter school legislation 20 years ago. Charter schools have been allowed to use 25% non-certified teachers. We did not want it to be that broad and open-ended, so we put that two-year time frame in there. Two even years though it has them. been successful with the charter school. Well, that's two years for them to even apply, not two years for them to get certification. And I think, I think we mislead people when we indicate otherwise. I have, under your bill, two years to make up my mind that I want to even apply for certification. Meanwhile, I'm study teaching, teaching kids in critical courses and two years to decide if I can bring to that classroom everything that classroom needs to give that child an opportunity. I, I think that's more because non-certified teachers are gonna be your, some of your most successful, productive retirees that are not even sure they want a second career, but they wanna give back to the community that allowed them to have such a successful career, like many of us in this room. But that's not what the bill says. The bill doesn't say these are retirees. The bill says that these are people who come from other professions. If they were retirees who were retired teachers, and that was limited to that window of people, I would have less of a concern. But these are people who have never taught before it's, and who have now two years to make up their mind while they're teaching if they even want to teach and submit an application. Is that, am I misstating what the bill says? That is a part of it. They could be, be from any profession as long as they had the college degree and they had the work experience and they could pass all the other background. But there's nothing in the legislation that prohibits a retired teacher or administrator that did not continue their certification to come back into the classroom as a non-certified teacher. And I, I hear what you're saying. There's nothing to prohibit them, but this bill opens the door for a lot more. And I, I'm, I'm concerned because in my district and in a lot of rural districts across the state, we have had individuals who have not had the kind of core competency and certification needed, teaching the very courses that students are going to be graded on and teachers are going to be assessed on. And now we're opening the door to allow more people to come in who are not fully qualified to teach these very vulnerable students in vulnerable populations like rural communities in South Carolina. And then we'll wonder why the test scores are low because these people have no teaching experience. And just because you have poor competency in math, you might be a great mathematician, doesn't make you a good teacher because you've never had any teaching experience. Are you not concerned about that aspect of the bill? 
Well, I think that's why we were very concerned about having enough time for the professional development. But remember, this is only if a certified teacher is not available. As long as there is a certified teacher, that certified teacher will be in that classroom. But if there's not one available, instead of canceling the class or putting in a different substitute on whatever basis, they would be allowed to have a non-certified teacher. It's not the catch-all, end-all, perfect solution, but I think it's a way for us to make sure that every child and every school has a manageable class size with an adult with the proper background and proper training to assist those students to achieve all they can achieve. Ms. Felder, your time on the amendment has expired. Pending question is the adoption of Amendment 1. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. There being no further amendments on the bill, pending question, second reading, House Bill 3590, roll call required in order. We'll vote on the board. Time's expired. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. A uh, vote of 99 to 17. House Bill 3590 is amended. See second reading. Bottom of page one, members. House will be in order. Clerk will read. 3319. John Richard Christopher King. Education favorable as is. Ms. Felder is recognized on the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Bill 3319 specifies, we've had this conversation before, so I'll try to be as brief as I can be. House Bill 3319 specifies that the same federally reimbursable meal must be offered to all students, regardless of whether a student has a meal balance owed to the school. Schools offering food that does not qualify for federally reimbursable a la carte items may not allow students to accrue a balance when purchasing those items. Schools can only accept cash payments or have prepaid um, si situations for those a la carte items. For the most part, the school lunch program is governed by the federal law all students, regardless of free or reduced price eligibility, will be offered the same reimbursable meals. Schools and districts may not invoke penalties 
such as prohibiting field trips or participation in graduation ceremonies for schools who owe money for school for students who owe money for school meals, whether that's a school lunch or a school breakfast. The State Department of Education will develop a model policy and a template for districts to use when it comes to the collection of any school meal debt. Pending question, second reading, House Bill 3319. Roll calls acquired and ordered. We'll vote on the board. House will be in order. We have our doctor of the day. Doctor, we are delighted to have you here in the South Carolina House of Representatives. Thank you for your service to the body today. I'm going to recognize Representative Britton to introduce our doctors of the day in the back. Representative Britton. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce the doctors of the day. We have with us today Dr. Brandon and Aaron Coakley of Myrtle Beach. They're specialized in dermatology. They are the first Mohs doctors, surgeons in the South Carolina, which is a special surgery for skin cancer. They're hoping to expand their practices to Florence and Dillon counties. They also take care of a very important person to me, my grandfather, Reverend Tom Britton. So uh, with, with uh, all I can do for y'all. Thank you so much for what you do for us. Uh, if y'all would please recognize Dr. Aaron and Dr. Brandon Coakley. Doctors, welcome to the South Carolina House. Thank you for your service today. <laughs> close the close, talk to tabulate. A vote of 113 to zero. House Bill 3319 receives second reading. We're middle of page two members, House Bill 3037, Clerk will read. 3037. Mr. Garvin, education favorable with amendment number one of the committee award, which they have. Ms. Govan is recognized to explain the committee report. Ms. This bill, uh, it was a strike, a strike all amendment, and was inserted in, uh, inserted, uh, in the language by the um, Education and Public Works Committee. What it does, it, it amends existing law to require medical certification for conditions. The driver requests to be noted on the driver's license and motor vehicle record. Uh, it has the DMV fully operationalize the laws for notating autism and our other disorders on a driver's license by July 1, 2022. Conditions may be designated with a conducis uh, pronounced uh, on the back of the license, including neurological disorders or brain injury, neuroimmune conditions, mental illness disorders that may cause seizures and other conditions such as allergies, diabetes, or heart disease. And the items in the amendment were from a list given to us by DMV when we discussed the ways the department could implement this and other current laws passed unanimously. And I just want to commend Mr. Garvin for working so well with DMV and the other entities involved in terms of getting everything squared away, move for passage. Pending question is the adoption of amendment one. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed nay, the ayes have it. Amendment one being a committee amendment, Mr. Govan having explained the bill when he explained the amendment, the pending question is, second reading on House Bill 3037, roll call is required in order, we'll vote on the board.
To all members wish to vote, voted. So objection to cutting the roll call short. Does any member object to cutting the roll call short? Hearing no objection, polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. A vote of 115 to zero. House Bill 3037 is amended, receives second reading. Time has expired in the uncontested period. Ms. Allison moves that we recur to the morning hour. All in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Bringing us back to the bottom of page two, House Bill 3465. Clerk will read. Three, four, six, five. Kill them. This bill came out of education in favor with amendment number one. The committee report, which they have number one. House Bill 3465. It's the committee report. The House Bill again 3465. Mr. Gillum is recognized to explain the committee report. Hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. just a minute, Mr. Gillum. We're on the committee amendment. It's amendment one. Ms. Felder is recognized to explain the committee amendment. I'm sorry, Mr. Gillum. Ms. Felder is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the committee amendment will become the bill. The bill creates a study committee to examine and report on three items. We've heard so much from our teachers across the state. Teacher credentialing requirements with a focus on the quality level of teacher credentials and student outcomes. The committee will recommend policies to strengthen teacher credentialing requirements teacher education programs, and the distribution of teachers to the area of greatest need. The need for veteran teachers to continue to meet certificate renewal requirements if it is needed or not. The benefit and challenges of requiring and funding the National Board Teacher Certification. The committee will ex consist of 11 members, two appointed by the chair of the House Education and Public Works, two appointed by the chair of the Senate Education Committee, two early childhood education, elementary education, or secondary education scholars or faculty members from our colleges or universities who have expertise in teacher credentialing, three parents of public school students appointed by the governor, and two members appointed by the state superintendent of education. A report would be due back to this General Assembly before January 1st of 2022. Pending question is the adoption of Amendment 1. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no, the ayes have it. Amendment 1 is adopted. Clerk will read. Amendment number 2, numero 2. This one is Representative Gillum. Well, Amendment 2, Mr. Gillum is recognized on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is what uh, we're trying to do on this amendment. We're trying to amend it back to its original language. And we're simply, uh, and it's going to be up, you know, if teacher has a 120-hour requirement for recertification uh, every five years, 
They have to do professional development in their school district. Every school district in South Carolina has professional development that they have to attend and do. So what we're doing is dropping in this amendment and in this original bill, the way it was originally built, was to drop the 120-hour requirement for every teacher for recertification after they have taught for 20 years. If they have taught for two decades, we look at they can drop that 120-hour requirement, do the, but we're requiring them to do the school district's professional development. After 20 years, folks, they can teach a kid if they still have a job, but they still have to go through 120-hour requirements plus the professional development that they do in their school district every year. So that is the thing. We're saying we're dropping the 120-hour requirement. They have to attend their professional development after they've taught for two decades. Their professional development does that. That teaches them new IT, new systems, all that stuff, and they do that every year instead of the 120-hour requirement, which is sometimes a very big burden on them to meet those hours. So that's going to drop that. They still have 20 years of experience teaching a child. If they still have a job, we know they can do that. Simple bill, I hope that we can amend this back to its original form. Mr. Hill is recognized for a question. Mr. Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Gillum, for taking my question. Um, so if I understand you correctly, this, this bill takes uh, the, the bill which was amended with, by the committee to replace the original bill with a study committee. And, and you're wanting to take it back to its original form, which I assume is what you filed. Um, can, can, do you have uh, teachers in, in, in your district, as, as I do in mine, that um, used to teach and no longer teach in the classroom, that have left the classroom? I do. Uh, would, it, would it be true to say that many of these people are people that have left the classroom due to getting frustrated with the um, with with many things about the way the system works, but much of it, much of it has having to do with um, the amount of paperwork and the amount of red tape that they that they have to spend their time dealing with, rather than actually being allowed to teach in the classroom and do what they care most about, and that is teach the kids. And I can't speak for anybody, but I believe that would be possible, Mr. Hill. Okay. And did you know, Mr. Gillum, that um, one of the questions I always ask myself when I'm reading bills is does this bill actually does this bill actually do anything and i believe that uh, legislative study committees are a waste of our time because you know any of us can study an issue and then file a bill that actually solves that issue but to pass legislation that says we're going to form a committee to study the issue and issue a report that nobody's going to care about or do anything with uh is, is usually a uh, a cop out, did you know, Mr. Gillum? And, and so when I'm reading bills, I'm looking, does this have substantial effect? And I believe that we're wasting our time on this floor uh, if we're passing bills that don't have substantial effect, Mr. Gillum. Did you know that? I do, Representative Hill. And, and Mr. Gillum, I believe your amendment restores the substantial effect of this bill, and I, I thank you for, for filing this. Thank you, Representative. I appreciate it. Ms. Allison is recognized for a question. Uh, yes, Ms. Representative Allison. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Gillum, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, your amendment does not replace the bill. Your amendment is just added to the existing legislation in another section. Am I correct? I went back to the original, some of the original language that was in the bill. Ms. Rita, that's it goes back to your original, <coughs> but but on the bill that we're talking right. yes, about, it uh, it's added to Ms. Felder's presentation earlier. Correct. Yes, ma'am. That was the bill, and I'm asking to take it back to the original. Yes, sir. I understand, but I just wanted to clarify that it is an addition to your, the original bill that we're talking about, which is which is correct. I yes, ma'am. Yes, thank Original. you. Let me ask you one other question. If a teacher has been teaching for these number of years and retires and is out for 10 years, does this apply to them? Not necessarily, uh, Representative Allison. If, 
because if they've out 10 years, they've lost, missed a lot in professional development. Right. Now, if they would continue to do and keep up with the professional development that the districts do to keep them up to date on the new systems, IT equipment, uh, that kind of thing, that would. Yes, sir. But well, they, could, they could come back and go back through somehow that they've had, if the districts had a plan to do that. Very good. Well, I agree with what you're trying to do. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The question is the adoption of Amendment 2. Mr. King, you had a question? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have a question for you in reference to your amendment. Your amendment, is it adding to what Mrs. Felder has done, or are you replacing it to make that now the bill? Yes. What happened, 3465, this is the original bill that I'm putting up. The committee, the subcommittee, made an amendment to it, what Ms. Felder has up. I'm looking to take it back to the original language. Do you know that you're not doing that with this amendment? I am not. No, sir. Well, you're just adding to what she has to go with the study committee. Yeah, because, well, I'm adding to it then to drop Thank the you. 120 hour. Thank you. Pending question. Mr. Williams is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just got a couple of simple questions um, as it relates to this. Um, Mr. Gillum, what, what actually happened from the time you introduced this bill up until now? What, what are the, you know, because you, the original bill indicates that what you indicated here, but now you introduce an amendment for the same thing. What, what happened between an issue and now that caused you to change your mind to go back. I'm just curious. Thank you. It is, um, when it first come up, I was asked by some people to pull back and let's discuss some things about it. Didn't happen. I pulled it back, but it didn't happen. So we combined two bills and, uh, and this is what come out of the two bills that we combined between mine and Mr. Collins. So as we got here, I wanted to look at getting back to some of the original language of removing the 120 hours. Okay. Um, as, as relates to expiration, do teachers' certificate have an expiration date on them? Uh, uh, you know, once you get a teacher's certificate, you can have it forever. I think when they is, recertify every five years. Every five years? And, and, and what you're trying to do now is, after 20 years, allow the teachers to go back and just teach without going through the e without going through any kind of form of training no sir you're not trying to no do it is they have for every school district in south carolina has professional development for the staff every year and that's what they have to attend they have to attend them usually some of the first five days of school before the kids get there is professional development plus throughout the months some people have it once a month some people have it twice a month that is the professional development that they get without the 120 hour requirement. Okay, all right, thank you. Mr. Hart. Mr. Hart, you got about a minute and a half. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Gilliam, thank you, and I appreciate it, but I just want to make sure I'm clear because I do have some concerns. So I understand Representative Allison's question to you that this is adding. This is not a striking insert, but help right. me understand if we do adopt this amendment, then what really is the point of the study committee? Because somebody wanted it, Mr. Ott, that is the way I understand it. We, this is the thing, we have a, did you know? Sir? We have a, did you know we have a EOC, what's called an Education Oversight Committee? And did you know we have a state school board that, that helps with these things too? That, and, but if somebody sees a committee needed, my main goal, if they want to look at this and find a better avenue to do it, is to drop the 120-hour requirement. And, and, I, and I understand that, but, but again, if we, if we statutorily pass this, then, then we're really taking it out of the hands of the study committee and saying, y'all can meet, but we've already decided what we're going to do. And, and I'm just concerned that, you know, there's a lot more to what the study committee was going to be looking at. Absolutely. And, and I understand after talking with the State Department of Education, that they've got a lot of things already in the works. I mean, they, they acknowledge the fact, and, and I'm not necessarily against the proposal that you're talking about, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I just think that we ought to allow them to be able to look at what they need to look at and make sure that we are, are taking into consideration, you know, exactly what this type of provision would do and how it would actually interact with some of the other provisions that the State Department is trying to also do. And I'm just scared that we might be getting the cart before the horse if we adopt this type of amendment. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm all for making sure that we take a look at this, but if we adopt this amendment, Mr. Gilliam, then we're really gutting the whole point of having a study committee, in my opinion. Did you know? Well, thank you. And did you know that this bill was put in last year? Mr. Gilliam, I'm sorry your time's expired on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any questions? Mr. Speaker, I request debate. Mr. Ott, request debate. Pending question. Ms. Brawley requests debate. Ms. McDaniel requests debate. Ben Darvis. Mr. Kirby. Mr. Alexander. Ms. Hennigan. Ms. Cobb Hunter. Ms. Murray, hello, Johnson, Ms. Dillard, Mr. Rivers, Mr. Moore, Anderson, Robert Williams, Mr. Anderson. Mr. McKnight, that was his chance. We'll send that over to the contested gallery. Page three, House Bill 3941, Clerk will read. Cox. 3941 education favorable as as is 3941 this is education it was Ms. Felder is recognized on House Bill 3941 Ms. Felder we should have your flight coverage thank you thank you thank you Mr. Speaker House Bill 3941 is by Representative Alexander, Chair Lady Allison, and Representative Kirby. That's, that's it, re it is a joint resolution requiring each public school district to develop an emergency sick leave plan using elementary and secondary school emergency relief funds within 15 calendar days after the bill is adopted. The district plan would indicate whether they would provide paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave to eligible employees, employees for specific qualifying reasons related to COVID-19. Plan should require that leave must be identical to the leave previously mandated by the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Plan should also indicate that a teacher must be considered to having a qualifying reason for leave if a health care provider determines that the teacher should not work in the school building because the teacher is at an increased risk of severe illness due to COVID-19. The State Department of Education would provide information needed for developing emergency sick leave plans to school districts. The State Board of Education and the local school districts may not take retaliatory action against an employee who asks for emergency leave under a sick leave plan developed pursuant to this joint resolution. Pending question, second reading, House Bill 3941. Roll call is acquired and order. We'll vote on the board.
For all members, please vote voted. Time expired. Polls are closed. Clerk, tabulate. A vote of 110 to 4. House Bill 3941. Receive second reading. Takes us bottom of page 3. House Bill 3883. Clerk will read. 3883 is a bill by the groom, Bucky Collins. Education, favorable. With amendment number one, the committee report, which I have. All right, members, we're on amendment one. It's the committee report to Representative Collins's bill. While we're on Representative Collins's bill, this may be an appropriate time for all of us to stand up and congratulate him on his recent wedding. Neil, congratulations. Neil the, state of, Neil, the state of California called, though, and said that Judge Clary is not a licensed minister in California, so you're going to have to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Felder is recognized on the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Competency-based education. We've talked about this a lot the past few years. It allows children to learn and progress at their own pace. It is already happening in many South Carolina schools, and the State Department of Education has been working on it for several years and has developed a separate department that is handling competency-based education. The bill would allow schools to create alternative ways of educating students and assessing them to ensure mastery of the subject. State and federal assessments are still required. School districts must seek a waiver from applicable state statutes and regulations from the state board to become a competency-based school. This helps speed up the process of implementing the program. The state board cannot waive any anti-discrimination laws, health, safety, civil rights, and disability right requirements. Schools must consult with parents before applying to become a competency-based school. The bill has already passed the House three times, once in the Omnibus Education Improvement Act and twice in standalone legislation. Pending question is the adoption of Amendment 1. All in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Amendment 1 is adopted. Clerk will read. Being no further amendments, the pending question is the adoption of House Bill 3883 is amended. Roll call is required and ordered. We'll vote on the board.
All members, please vote voted. Time's expired. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. A vote of 108 to 4. House Bill 3883 is amended to receive second reading. Taking us to the top of page 4, House Bill 4006. Clerk will read. 4 double off 6. Merle Smith, judiciary favorable in his original state. Mr. Caskey is recognized on the bill. House will be in order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this bill is, is very straightforward. Last year, uh, when we came back in for the second iteration of our session due to the COVID, uh, we signed into law Act 167. Among uh, the provisions of that act, one was that uh, breweries would be able to sell uh, cans or other containers for off-premise consumption. Uh, that was limited uh, prior to that to 288 ounces. Uh, which is equivalent of two cases. What we passed last year uh, expanded that to 567 ounces or the equivalent of four cases of beer. Again, this is a brewery, their ability to sell uh, for off-premise consumption. Uh, that act was set to, set to sunset on May 31st. This bill extends the sunset period uh, to May of 2022. Uh, again, this was in response to COVID to allow local breweries an expanded opportunity to sell their products for off-premise consumption. Pending question, second reading House Bill 4006. Roll call is required and ordered. We'll vote on the board. All right, members, we will be back this afternoon after we vote on this bill. It's my intention to take a motion to recede until 2.30. We will start no later than 240. So as soon as we have 63 folks in the room, we're going to get going. Close the close, clerk will tabulate. A vote of 99 to 10, House Bill 4006 is amended, receives second reading. Time has expired in the uncontested period. Mr. Forrest moves that we recur to the morning hour. 
All in favor say aye. Those opposed nay, the ayes have it. Mr. Taylor moved that the House now recede until 2.30 p.m. All in favor say aye. Opposed nay, the ayes have it. House is in recess to 2.30.
I've got quorum call, quorum call. All members, please record your presence. Quorum call, quorum call. All members, please record your presence. We're in the quorum call.
test. Quorum call, quorum call. All members, please record your presence.
quorum call, quorum call. All members, please record your presence.
All right, a quorum is present. House will be in order. Back on the statewide uncontested calendar. All right. Clerk will read. Mr. Simmerl. 36. 20, 3620 is a Representative Gilliard's bill. The bill passed the Judiciary Committee favorably with amendment number one. And amendment number one is a committee report. Judiciary. Mr. Murphy requests debate. Okay, girls. Mr. Hill requests debate. Mr. Fry. Mr. Pope. Mr. Simrel, Ms. Kimmins, Mr. Elliott, Mr. Long, Mr. Magnuson, Mr. Whitmire, Mr. Finley, Mr. Bailey, Mr. Hewitt, Mr. Gatch, Ms. Erickson, Mr. Herb Kurzman, Mr. Hyde, Mr. Moore, Ms. Steve Moss, Travis Moore, Ms. Steve Moss, Mr. Long, Mr. Dabney, Ms. O'Remus, Ms. Cobb Hunter, almost the clerk has asked me to slow down, Ms. Bennett, Mr. Nutt, Mr. Cox, Mr. Clyburn, Mr. King, Mr. Bamberg, Ms. Trantham, I got, Mr. I got got you, Mr. May, Ms. Dillard, Ms. McGarry, Mr. Johnson, Jeff, if he asked that, tell him. Mr. Garvin, Mr. Hosey, Ms. Hennigan. Who are you pointing at, Mr. Hewitt? Mr. Newton, I'm sorry. Thank you. West, Mr. Weston Newton. Mr. Smith, Mark, I'll send it to the contested county. All right, Clerk will read. Members, where we are. Bottom of page four, House Bill 3164. Clerk will read. House will be in order. 3164, McCravey. Mr. McCravey has passed this bill favorably out of the Education Committee. Amendment number one would be the committee report education. Amendment number one. Ms. Felder is recognized on amendment number one, House Bill 3164. Ladies and gentlemen, we're down at the page, bottom page of four. Again, our intention is to go through all bills on the uncontested calendar. So today we will go from page four, hopefully through page 12. Ms. Felder is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The amendment was just a code correction in the legislation. House Bill 3164, the committee amendment corrected a reference to an, uh, an other code section. Uh, beginning with the 22-23 school year, House Bill 3164 requires public school districts to make the following test available to homeschool students if the tests are also available to students who attend the schools in the district. The advanced placement of the AP test, the preliminary scholastic aptitude test, or the national merit scholarship qualifying test, the pre-ACT, and the college and career readiness and assessment and summative assessments. Most of our public school districts throughout the state 
already are doing this, where they allow the homeschool students to come in and participate in that testing when that testing requires a certified testing proctor. Districts will then adopt written policies that specify the date by which students must register to participate in the testing. Parents must be told of registration deadlines and the availability of financial assistance for low-income students. Districts must charge homeschool students the same fees, if any, that are charged to public school students for taking the assessment. The South Carolina Department of Education will create a homeschool identification code to differentiate homeschool students from the traditional public school students for the purpose of reporting assessments. Mr. King, recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ms. Felder actually answered my question at the end. I wanted to know if the homeschool student scores would affect the actual public school student scores and how it would um, equate to both of them. But you answered my question. Thank you. Separate code. Mr. Robert Williams has a question. Thank you, Ms. Felder. Um, question, where would the location take place in terms of testing? Uh, would they be testing in the school or on the school premises or somewhere? Yes, currently now in our public high schools, they have a date where these various exams are administered. As I said, Representative Williams, and thank you for allowing me to clarify, most districts already have a very good relationship with their community and their homeschooled students. A few of the members, though, brought forth um, some situations where the district were not allowing homeschool students to come in and participate in that testing. So therefore, the students and their families were forced to travel long distances to another school district that would allow them to come in and take the test. Okay. There's no penalty for not taking the test for homeschool students. No, no, sir, but most of these students, especially for like AP placement test, when they have ambitions to further their education, th those tests are somewhat required for that track of education, and they're required to be proctored by someone certified to give an AP test. Okay, my last question deals with um, um, tracking the data for these homeschool students. Is that data being will be tracked to, to determine, you know, who's taking those tests or anything? Thank you, Mr. Williams. That was a concern that some of our school districts had, that then the, the homeschool student and the in-class brick and mortar student, their test scores would be commingled and they wouldn't really know how their students did versus the homeschool. So the legislation requires the State Department of Education to create a homeschool identification code. So that student that's homeschool would have that code on their test. Whereas if I were the student taking it at Nation Ford High School, which is a traditional public school brick and mortar, I would be using NFS, okay. Nation Ford School. All right, thank you, Ms. Felder. Ms. Bamberg, recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I was looking at this and looked at uh, the fiscal impact statement for this and saw that the fiscal impact to local schools uh, apparently hasn't been determined. Do we know how much, and for example, I look at uh, Bamberg County or Allendale County where Representative Hosey or Barnwell where we're undergoing consolidation and money is already really tight. Do, is there any more information on how much is it going to actually cost our small, more impoverished school districts to implement this? Or is that something that nobody no, really knows the answer to? Well, the Office of Revenue and Fiscal Affairs does not anticipate any expenditure impact because if there's a fee, Representative Bamberg, to take the test, 
if there's a fee, that homeschool student still must pay that fee to participate. So the only expense that I could see a district incurring is having another desk to allow that homeschool students to sit in and participate in the test. Okay, because I'm, I'm looking at this, it says, apparently the, the uh, SDE surveyed 79 regular school districts and two charter districts, and they received responses from 21 of the districts. This is from the fiscal impact statement. 14, did you know, of the responding districts indicate that the bill will have no expenditure impact, so it wouldn't cost them any money. But it goes on to say that three of the districts indicated that the bill would increase expenses by a range of $10,000 to $100,000 for test proctors, expenses for testing rooms, and travel costs for the home school students. But we don't know what, or do you know which, which three districts those were? And if there were only responses from 21 of the 79 regular school districts, there's a big portion of school districts in this state that we haven't even heard from as far as what the financial, Bamberg County don't have extra $100,000. Neither does Barnwell or Allendale. And, and that's my concern with this. And if we don't have the answers to that, should we wait and actually get those answers before voting on this? Because on behalf of my constituents, if I, if I vote yes, and I don't know the answer to how much it's going to cost them, and they turn around and it costs them a hundred grand. Well, then I'm going to be up here asking this body for more money. Well, probably either way, we're going down that road, <laughs> Representative Bamberg. <laughs> but thank you. But can you tell me the date on your fiscal impact statement? Um, this fiscal impact statement is from March 23rd of 2021. On House Bill 3164? 3164, introduced on January 12th. Uh, subject AP testing, impact date, March 23rd, 2021, updated for additional agency response. Okay. So this, this would have been the fiscal impact that was updated after they apparently got more responses from local school districts in the state. Yeah. And I apologize, I do not have that fiscal impact statement. The one I have clearly said that they did not anticipate any anticipated expenditure because again, you're already giving the exam to your in-person students. So the only additional cost would be to make sure a desk was available for that homeschool student to come in and participate. If there were any fees for the test itself, that homeschool student would have to pay those fees. Um, if I would respectfully like to request debate on this in hopes that maybe we can get some more of the financial information, particularly because of the, the smaller counties that don't have the ability to generate it might only be $10,000 or $50,000, but in a lot of districts in the state, until we finish all our plans of, of education, we don't have anywhere to, to find that money um, because the bulk of our funds, for example, in Bamberg County go towards paying school bond debts because we haven't been able to fund our facilities and everything. So I, I would request debate in hopes that we can get some additional information. Mr. Bamberg requests debate on House Bill 3164. Mr. Pendarvis requests debate. Mr. King requests debate. Mr. McKnight requests debate. Ms. Matthews requests debate. Ms. Robinson requests debate. Mr. Gilliard requests debate. Ms. Murray requests debate. Ms. McDaniel requests debate. Ms. Henderson Myers requests debate. Mr. Hosey requests debate. Mr. Govan requests debate. Ms. Shedron Williams requests debate. Ms. Johnson requests debate. Ms. K.O. Johnson. Ms. Jefferson requests debate. Mr. McCravey requests debate. 
And that will put that on the contested calendar. Clerk will read. Next bill is 3164. 3164 by Mr. McCravey. Educate. No. I'm sorry. Please excuse 31, me. 3795. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 3795 by Ms. Allison. Education. Favorable. Amendment number one, which is the committee report number one. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on page five. House Bill 3795. 3795, Amendment one. Ms. Felder, are you presenting on Amendment 1? Ms. Felder is recognized on House Bill 3795, Amendment 1. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And hello again, ladies and gentlemen of the House. Um, if adopted, the amendment will become the bill. House Bill 3795 creates the Sign Language Interpreters Act and applies to all defined agencies and hospital systems that are regulated by DHEC. Currently, we do not have a uniform Sign Language Interpreters Act. This legislation would create the Sign Language Interpreters Act where a person may provide interpreting, interpreting services for a state agency or hospital only if they have a recognized cert certification register with the Department of Labor, Licensing and Regulation, and pay a fee established by LLR. Individuals may operate as a provisional interpreter for up to two years if they are not certified, but are registered and have paid the fee and work under the supervision of a certified interpreter. LLR must maintain a sign language interpreter's registry and database on its website. The department must provide an online registration form for prospective interpreters and verify that applicants have the proper certification. Persons who violate the provisions could face a civil penalty of no more than $500. The bill does not apply non-residents who possess a recognized certification and provide interpreting services in the state for no more than 20 days per year. It also does not apply in cases of emergency where a certified interpreter is not available. If an agency or a hospital has more rigorous requirements for an interpreter, their standards would prevail. The South Carolina Department of Education, in consultation with the South Carolina Association of the Deaf and the South Carolina Registry of Interpreters of the Deaf, must develop regulations regarding credentials for sign language interpreters in public schools and in special schools. The effective date for agencies and schools to comply is January 1 of 2023. Ms. Matthews, Ms. Matthews, no. Mr. Yao recognized for a question. Thank you, Ms. Felder. You said something about out of state, the bill doesn't apply. So does that mean that if you're a South Carolina resident and you're doing it for 20 days, we're, lim we're allowing LLR to charge South Carolina citizens, but not out-of-state citizens? Okay, the, the legislation allows non-residents who possess a recognized certification and provide interpreting service in our state for mo no more than 20 days. So if you had a need, a, a huge court case or a hospital case or a school that needed a temporary substitute they could come for 20 days per year. At no, at, and they don't have to pay a fee like South Carolina citizens? They would not have to pay you a You said fee. LLR was allowed to charge. Correct. All right, will they, be, will they be charging North Carolina residents for those 20 days? No, they would so, not. It would just be a temporary. So why, why would we not allow South Carolina residents the same leeway free of charge for 20 days? Well, we may have neighboring states that do have that compact agreement 
if North Carolina were to need a South Carolina interpreter, but it's mainly there for an emergency situation where an interpreter is not available. So in Chesterfield County, where we're a border county, they need an interpreter for 19 days. From, they, got, they got a choice. They can choose two, one from South Carolina, one from North Carolina. The one from North Carolina can come in and work without paying LLR fee. The one from South Carolina can come in and work, but pay LLR fee, is that correct? Well, I think the South Carolina Department of Education in consultation with the South Carolina Association for the Deaf and the South Carolina Registry of Interpreters of the Deaf, they're gonna develop the regulations regarding the credentials for this. So it's very possible they may have some kind of temporary licensing fee, but it is not outlined in the legislation that mandates them to do that. But what it does mandate is that North Carolina does not apply to, the bill does not apply to North Carolina residents or Georgia residents or anywhere else, and that applies that they do not pay a fee but South Carolina residents do pay a fee to LLR that is set by LLR, is that correct? If that out-of-state interpreter is going to interpret for 20 days or less. So South Carolina residents, if they're only gonna interpret for 20 days or less, they are charged a fee by LLR, is that correct? That is correct, so they we are have taxing, to be registered. So are we taxing South Carolina residents and not out-of-state residents? for the same thing? I think that Representative Yao, the point we're missing is if we were gonna hire an interpreter, if a hospital system, their interpreters on vacation or on maternity leave and they look to a neighboring state, that interpreter is going to be licensed and registered in their home state. So they have paid a fee. But they have not paid a fee to the state of South Carolina like we no, are expecting. Sir. South Carolina residents who pay taxes already in the state of North, in South Carolina to do. They're getting all free when we're charging people that may do it on a volunteer basis, may do it temporary. We're charging those individuals to do a service to the state of South Carolina when we're allowing South, North Carolina, Georgia, out-of-state residents to do it for free. And that's what I'm understanding. Is that correct? If they're licensed in their home state, there's nothing in this that mandates we charge that temporary sign language interpreter a fee. But it does, it does mandate that LLR will have the option to charge whatever they want to a South Carolina citizen, correct? Correct, they must pay the fee to LLR to be registered so we have to ask LLR how much they're going to charge us and request them to charge us so we can do a service to the state. When North Carolina, so if I move over to North Carolina and do the same job, I don't have to pay. Is that, that's what I'm understanding. You would pay in North Carolina, I am sure. Most See, all but of But that's the, not what we're not discussing, North Carolina law. I we're discussing South Carolina saying. law, ma'am. I mean, that's a, a tax that we're giving LLR the authority to do is charge South Carolina residents when they're not charging North Carolina residents. The sign language interpreters have come to us for several years now asking for some formalized legislation that verifies the qualifications of that sign language interpreter. Do we Th know this that was the compromise that has been worked out? Why can't we move to recommit this and get it found out? I mean, we, we, we don't know. What I'm getting at is that we're paying we're charging South Carolina residents. Do we know that our South Carolina residents, if they go to North Carolina, are they gonna be charged a fee? Do we? We're leaving a window for a 20-day emergency if, use of a non-South Carolinian if, that is a qualified sign interpreter. If South Carolina residents go to North Carolina to do the same thing, do we pay a fee? Or Georgia? I, I would have to pull North Carolina rules and see, but I do know that our sign language interpreters in South Carolina wanted, ask for this. They ask for this legislation. I understand the, the groups do. I'm just, I, I have a problem charging South Carolina residents when we don't charge, I mean, out of state residents. Thank you. Thank you.
Question is adoption. House Bill 3795, roll call is required, voting on the board's order. I'm sorry, question is adoption amendment number one. All in favor say aye. All opposed? Amendments, uh, the amendment one is adopted. Clerk of Reed. Question before us now is adoption House Bill 3795 as amended, roll call is required, voting on the board's order. Like to welcome former Representative Mary Tinkler to the floor. Mary, good to see you again. Thank you. Right there. Give, give us the way. All members wishing to vote, voted. All members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection? Closing roll call. Any objection? Here none. Clerk, close polls, tabulate. Voter 7835, House Bill 3795, receives second reading. Clerk will read. Next bill, 3524, Hickson and Forrest, LCI is passed out favorably in its original. Mr. Cogswell is recognized. On House Bill 3524, there's no amendment. We're on the bill. House Bill 3524, Ms. Cogswell was recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, H 3524 is a co another COVID-related bill that extends a sunset on adopting legislation that relates to limiting the rights of for-profit pipeline companies on, among other things, eminent domain. Mr. Hickson and Mr. Forrest, the main sponsors of the bill, have been working diligently on a more comprehensive legislation, but largely due to delays related to COVID, the previous sunset of November 20th, November 2020, has passed. They are now simply asking for that date to be pushed to June 30th, 2022. Uh, this easily passed unanimously, both subcommittee and committee, so if there are no questions, I would certainly appreciate your support. Question is adoption, House Bill 3524, roll calls required, voting on the board's order. All members wishing to vote, voted. All members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection? Closing roll call.
Any objection? Close in a roll call. Hearing none, clerk close polls tabulate. Vote one twelve zero. House Bill 3524 receives second reading. Clerk will read. The next bill, 4062, Sandabil and West. LCI has passed it out favorably with the committee report, which would be amendment number one. Amendment number one is the LCI committee report. Mr. West, Mr. West. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, get a little order. As you know, we've got a number. Of Let me try this and over. Time has expired. Mr. West moves and we were occurred in the morning hour. All in favor say aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. We're now back on the bill before us, House Bill 4062, Amendment 1. Again, I just want to call to your attention, if you have if conversations, take them outside. I, I know where we're going to end up with this. We're going to start heading into the evening hours, and people are going to be disappointed we're still here. So the quicker, we, if you can stay close, and the quicker we move through the bills, they're all important to the, the people that have sponsored them. We try to get this work done today. All righty. Mr. West is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Bill 4062 addresses the Public Service Commission. There are basically four areas that were taken up in this amendment. Uh, basically, it, add, it, it or not basically, it does allow the Public Service Commission to hire expert consultants in a particular area, and it provides the process for that to be transparent and unbiased. Uh, as well, in Section 2, it gives the PSC the ability to uh, request parties argue issues that the commission determines to be um, preferable in, in a current proceeding before the commission, uh, as well as when briefs have already been filed, it allows for them to do that as well, uh, ten, either 10 days before or 10 days after a filing so that they may bring up issues regarding a current issue that they deem to be appropriate in making an informed decision. Section three of the amendment requires that all candidates for the PSC must meet the qualifications that we worked on several years ago in this body. Uh, there was a part that has been stricken that allowed PERC to actually put forth a nomination of someone that did not fill those qualifications. Uh, that has now been removed so that every PERC member uh, or every candidate that is nominated to uh, serve on the PSC must meet the qualifications established in that statute. And finally, uh, it allows the commissioners of the Public Service Commission to re receive a per diem uh, for their work. Many of our commissioners live at various corners of the state, but they work in Columbia. Uh, this allows them to receive mileage and expenses just like you and I receive for our work here in Columbia, though we are not quite paid what they're paid. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, that, that contains the issues addressed in the amendment, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Mr. Lucky Johnson, recognized for a question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't feel quite so lucky today being here all day. <laughs> Quick question. Um, how much are the public, how much do the public service uh, commissioners make currently? I'm told by staff they make 132000 a year. $133,000, and you believe that they need a per diem? <laughs> That's my only question. Thank you. Mr. Covan, did you have a question, sir? This young man has been sitting next to me uh, so long now till he just read my mind. That is both interesting and terrifying at the same time, Mr. Govan. <laughs> 
So the question, seeing no more questions, the question is adoption. Oh, Ms. McDaniel, you've been sitting next to Mr. Govan also, man? You've been sitting next to Mr. King. Go ahead with your question, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Actually, you know, I was sitting by you earlier. <laughs> In committee. Um, I just was wondering, I think I've been sitting beside them a little bit too long as well. Are there any minorities on the Public Service Commission? Are there any blacks on the, on the Public Service Commission? Uh, yes, ma'am, Ms. McDaniel, uh, I am told by staff the chairman is a minority. The chairman is a minority. Is he black? Yes, ma'am. Praise God. So, but he's the only one, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, is there any um, provision for the employment of the advisory for other minor for minorities to be hired? Could you repeat that question, Ms. McDaniel? I, I'm having a hard time here. I'm, I'm not because of the body's talking, but because I'm virtually deaf. I was just curious on the, um, the amendment. Is there any provision to ensure that minorities are hired? Yes, ma'am, Ms. McDaniel, that, that is already in, in state law, um, and I believe that encompasses every state agency as well. Okay, thank you for entertaining my question. I just like diversity all throughout South Carolina. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. McDaniel. Mr. Magnuson, to recognize for a question. Hello, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Ott was talking. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and Mr. West. Um, did you know that I just did a Google search on how much the Public Service Commission makes? Do you know how much Ballotpedia says? Sorry, Mr. Magnus, the last part of your question was what? The, according to Ballotpedia, I just did a Google search and the Public Service Commissioners make 178000 Six hundred and nineteen dollars per year. Well, you know, Mr. Magnuson, right? I can tell you, I know you are an expert in the internet and how it works. But uh, if that's where you gather your facts, uh, I don't know. Uh, but I am told that Ballopedia is wrong. Okay. That 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 is about circuit court judges, and uh, it is the hundred and thirty-two thousand that our staff just told me about. Well, and and I appreciate that information. That's why we ask these questions. But uh, I, I know that the Public Service Commission makes a lot of money. I, I, I'm sure they do. Question is adoption amendment number one. All in favor say aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Amendment number one is adopted. The clerk will read. And there are no further amendments on House Bill 4062. So roll call is required. Voting on the board is ordered. Question is adoption. House Bill 4062 as amended.
Have all members wishing to vote voted? Have all members wishing to vote voted? Any objection to closing the roll call? Hear none, clerk, close polls, tabulate. Vote of 8622, House Bill 4062 is amendment, receives second reading. Clerk will read. In, uh, the next bill is House Bill 4060. 40, thank you. 4060 is Mr. Sandifer. LCI has also passed it out favorably with amendment number one, which is also the committee report. Number one. Mr. Coswell is recognized on amendment number one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. H4060 is a bill that relates to building codes. Specifically, it allows residential building codes to be updated uh, every six no later than seven years versus the current three-year time frame. It also includes commercial building codes, but little has changed to the three-year time frame uh, at, at the commercial builder's request. This bill also allows the Building Code Council to deny building codes that might not be relevant to our state within a certain time frame. That the council may, deny, may also deny a study committee's recommendations as it relates to new codes by a two-thirds vote. And that the Building Code Council must provide a fiscal impact study. This legislation has been asked for by the home builders so that they can have clarity through a longer time frame under which code they are operating. It is also supported by the building code officials, the commercial contractors, and it too passed unanimously out of subcommittee and full committee. This is a strike all and insert. Uh, so with that, if there are no questions, I would ask for your support. Seeing no questions, the question is adoption of amendment number one. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Clerk will read. There's no further amendments to 4060. Question before us is adoption House Bill 4060 as amended. Roll call is required. Voting on the board's order. All members wishing to vote, voted. All members wishing to vote, voted. You got a question? Ms. Danning, for what purpose do you rise? Uh, I have a point of order. Is it possible to leave the amendments up until the voting is done? We're moving through these pretty quick, and I hardly even got to read the amendment. Yes, sir. We'll ask Blake if he'll just keep them on a little bit longer when the amendment is the bill. Obviously, if we're following with subsequent amendments. And uh, your desk mate said he'll show you how to find it on the computer, too. <laughs> Time has expired. Clerk, close polls, tabulate. But 1050, House adopts that bill. 4060. Clerk, clerk will read. Thank you, baby. We're at the bottom page six. Clerk will read. Three. Two, four, three, also from LCI, also favorable with amendment number one, the committee. Report number one. Mr. Cogswell is recognized on amendment one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. H3243 is a bill that deals with licensure under LLR's mm -hmm. Title 40. Specifically, this bill allows for Thank individuals you. in the state that are not precluded from establishing residency under federal law to be allowed to apply for and receive professional licensure as defined under Title 40, provided all other criteria related to that license are met. 
Similar legislation exists in most other states as it helps fulfill the widening gap on specialty professions like nursing. To that end, this bill is supported by the Hospital Association as well as uh, most of the chambers around the state. Uh, this is a strike call and insert amendment that will become the bill. The reason for the amendment is to tighten up the language, to limit this only to licensure under Chapter 40, and to restrict the applicants to those not just lawfully present in our state, but those that are eligible for residency under federal law. This is the result of several years worth of work by Representative Collins on behalf of some of his constituents. So I ask that you join me in subcommittee and full committee in giving him a belated work, birth, wedding present to in support this bill. Glad to take any questions. I think Speaker already gave out the wedding presents, but the, cop, the, the question before us is adoption amendment number one. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Amendment number one is adopted. Clerk will read. There are no further amendments, so the question before us is adoption of House Bill 3243 on second reading as amended. Roll call is required. Voting on the board's order. If all members wishing to vote, voted. If all members wishing to vote, voted. Danny Nisbet brought to our attention that it's also getting removed from the computer screen fairly rapidly, too. So we're going to talk to staff about slowing that down a little bit for you, too. Yes, sir. <laughs> All members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection to closing roll call? Hearing none, clerk close polls tabulate. Voted 98 to 5. House Bill 3243 receives second reading. Clerk will read. Next bill is 4098. 4098. This bill is by the Regulations Committee and it went without reference. University Clemson State Crop. Best Commission. Mr. Burns is here to tell us about House Bill 4098. Mr. Burns, you okay? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Danning, I want you to get a good look so we can look at this uh, Asian longhorn beetle. We got it up on time so we can study it. It's about a, a little over an inch long. And it has come from somewhere and uh, invaded near Charleston, South Carolina. And there's about a 73 square mile area that's infested with it. Clemson University has uh, worked with us on the regulations to establish a zone to contain the uh, wood that goes out of this area, has to be inspected so it doesn't further go to the state. It is a federally regulated uh, beetle, and uh, if we don't regulate it here in South Carolina through Clemson, then the entire state will be quarantined. It's not a very popular word in our state, another quarantine. And uh, so these regulations allow Clemson to establish the quarantined area in that 73 square mile area to keep individuals from transporting 
things like firewood or lumber outside the area without a permit. Clemson has been working with the Forestry Commission and assures us that permitting requirements will be predictable, reasonable, and cost efficient. It received unanimous approval from the committee and I move for passage. Question is adoption of House Bill 4098. Roll calls required, voting on the board's order. If all members wishing to vote, voted. If all members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection to closing roll call? Any objection to closing roll call? Hear none, clerk, close polls, tabulate. But a 102 versus zero, the House is all against those Beatles. Uh, Mr. Burns, uh, I'm sorry, clerk could read. The next bill. 4099 is another regulations committee report went without reference. Mr. Burns is again recognized, House Bill 4099. I want to pause a minute and let Representative Danning have a chance to uh, look at this white tegu lizard, which grows up to four feet long and can weigh up to 10 pounds. And it comes to us uh, through Central America. It's moved up through uh, Florida and into Georgia, and we're trying to minimize its effect, its negative effect uh, in South Carolina. It brings uh, disease into South Carolina. It eats all manner of animals, animals' eggs and plants, and it's spreading across the Southeast. And this regulation further establishes permitting. We have some of these lizards here. We want to see that they get chipped and permitted and there's a 120-day time period, grace period, to get that done and get them registered and permitted. And it received unanimous approval from the committee, and I move for passage. Mr. Robert Williams has a question. I'm back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Bill. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Burns, just a quick question. Have, um, have you guys seen any of those reptiles here in South Carolina as of yet? Yes, sir, we have some here. I was mentioning in the last state, we have some here already. And what happens is a lot of the folks who have these, they get, they get them and they're real small as pets. And then they get three or four feet long and weigh 10 pounds or so and they don't want them in their house any longer, so they're just letting them out. And it's causing epidemic in our neighboring states. So we want to take control of this. Of those that are here, we want to permit them, and we want to chip them so we can find them if they escape or get away, so we can have control where they don't go out and eat all the turkey eggs and do all the destructive things that yeah. they do, so we'll know where they are. Yeah. So we're trying to protect South Carolina from the invasion of this uh, white tegu lizard. Okay, let me ask you this. Williams. Let me let me ask you this here real quickly. What are you doing with the individuals that have them currently in their home? Are we doing anything about the fact that individuals have them currently as pests? This this regulation will not permit any more to come here and be permitted. The ones that already have it, we got to deal with. So we're going to put a chip in those and permit the ones that are here. 
and not let any more come here if we can help it. So we're planning on putting chips in all the ones that are here currently? Yes, sir. Put if, chips if, in the back of the ones that are here so if they get away, we can find out where they are. Okay, and my final question. And DNR is the one who's responsible for this, by the way. DNR? DNR. Okay, uh, my, my final question. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Williams has legitimate questions. If we can give him the courtesy of being able to hear some, some folks want to hear his questions. Um, again, I appreciate if you have any conversation, we take them outside. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my last question, and I'm asking this question on the, on the basis of others. They want to know whether this uh, reptile can be cooked and eat. Not in this chamber and, with, and without a Woka Coca Cola. No, sir. All right. Thank you. Mr. Williams said he was actually asking for a friend. <laughs> so, the question, the question is adoption House Bill 4099, roll calls required, vote on the board's order. Miss Allison, Miss Felder, I would note if you bring some neat pictures, your bills seem to move a little better just for what it's worth. Have <laughs> all members wishing to vote voted? All members wishing to vote voted. Any objection to closing a roll call? Any objection to closing a roll call? Hearing none, clerk, close polls and tabulate. Vote of 1040, House 4099, receives second reading. Clerk will read. 4103, Representative Hill. This one without reference. Mr. J. West, for what purpose you rise, sir? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'd like, I move that uh, Bill 40, 4103 be referred to the LCI committee. My understanding this bill uh, passed without reference. Uh, to codify a proviso, my, my understanding is, after talking, talking with some stakeholders, that th this bill needs uh, more work and further attention and should go through the committee process. So, so you're requesting that House Bill 4103 be committed to 3M? No, sir, to LCI. LCI, I just seen if you were paying attention. All right, so committed to LCI. So the question before us is House Bill 4103, committed to LCI. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. 4103 is committed to LCI. Clerk will read. Okay, we have a new bill. Uh, excuse me, the next bill is 3546, Weston Newton. 3546, Weston Newton, and that bill is ways and means favorable, as is. Excuse me. Mr. Ballantyne's recognized on 3546 on the bill itself. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, I have uh, three bills here that have. Uh, handful of bipartisan sponsors, so hopefully we can move through these. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions when I'm done. First one is House Bill 3546, and what it simply does is it updates, excuse me, updates the statutes relating to the South Carolina Film Commission. 
It makes revisions that were recommended by our own House Legislative Oversight Committee. There is absolutely no fiscal impact, and the last time we had this bill in 2019, it passed 105 to 3. Happy to ask any answer any questions. Ms. Pendarvis recognized. Thank you, Mr. Valentine, for taking my question. This is a friendly question. Um, I support the bill out of curiosity. Do we have um, incentives, or what kind of incentives do we have in South Carolina uh, to bring more film to our state? Mr. Pendarvis, staff has told me we have put some in the budget. Um, just from what I remember from years ago when this debate first came about, uh, we don't do currently enough as some of our competitive states. We're losing a lot to Georgia. Uh, but this particular bill, as you know, doesn't spend any money. It just makes them focus a little bit more on what we would like to see happen with that commission. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I wholeheartedly agree. When I first got elected in 2017, one of uh, my supporters and biggest constituents is a big film guy. And he talked about how he lost a lot of business, obviously, to Georgia and some of our neighboring states. So hopefully, as we move forward, we do a better job of attracting that to South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Valentine. Thank you for the question, Mr. Congress. Question is adoption, House Bill 3546. Roll calls required, voting on the board's order. If all members wishing to vote, voted. If all members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection to closing the roll call? Any objection? Hear none, clerk, close polls and tabulate. Tabulate. Vote 87, 17, House Bill 3546 receives second reading. Clerk will read. Mr. Forrest moves we do now recur to morning hour. All in favor say aye. All opposed, the ayes have it. Clerk will read. Two seven one is a Senate bill which passed our Ways and Means Committee favorably as is. Mr. Ballantyne's recognized on Senate 271. Ladies and gentlemen, we're on top of page eight. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, Senate 271, again, is a bill with a bipartisan sponsorship. Um, what it does is it simply extends the South Carolina Abandoned Buildings Revitalization Act. Uh, that is set to uh, sunset uh, December 31st yep. of this year. It extends it to December 31st of 2015. Um, if you're not familiar, if you weren't here when we passed this bill several years ago, it encourages the restorations of abandoned buildings in communities. It's been a very successful program throughout the state in uh, all our markets and communities. Passed the Senate 42 to 1. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Mr. White, what purpose do you rise? Like Mr. Talley and Mr. Ballantyne, but can we adjourn debate till next week since it's the Senate bill and it doesn't expire to December the 31st? We could get our bills and get them over. It's not going to delay anything. I'm, I'm fine with that. Senate Bill 271, Mr. White moves to adjourn debate. All in favor say aye. Aye. This will be adjourned debate till next week. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Debates adjourned till next week. Tuesday the 13th, Clerk will read. 3144 B. White, this bill has passed ways and means favorable in its original state. Mr. Ballantyne's recognized on Mr. White's bill. This is my last one today, y'all. Uh, House Bill 3144 is the South Carolina 
workforce industry needs scholarship, commonly referred to as South Carolina WINS. For those of y'all that have not been here, we have funded this uh, in fiscal year 19, 20, and 21 budgets. We've also, it's in the current fiscal year 21 budget, uh, passed the House 105 to 0 in 2019. Um, as you know, that where there's a critical shortage of qualified applicants in various critical industries in our state. And this is designed to encourage individuals to continue in a two-year uh, institution and to have their tuition fully paid. So whatever the lottery currently does not cover for them, this opportunity would cover, come in and make it basically a free education for them. Um, it's capped up to no more than $2,500. Um, to give you an idea, and all the technical schools around our state have been uh, using this feature to the tune of about $15 million, helping over 15,000 students in our state. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question is adoption, House Bill 3144. Roll call is required. Voting on the board's order. All members wishing to vote, voted. If all members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection to closing roll call? Just trying to help you out with the exercise, Mr. Govan. Any objection to closing the roll call? Any objection to closing a roll call? Hearing none, clerk, close polls, tabulate. Tabulate. 105 to 1, House Bill 3144 received second reading. Clerk will read. House Bill 3948 is Leonidas Stavernakis. The bill passed ways and means favorably. To the amendment number one, which is also the committee report. There's two bills. First is the committee report. Second is Merle Smith and Ben Darby's. There's two bills. Ms. Crawford's going to tell us about the First Amendment. 3948 would allow a county already imposing a transportation penny sales and use tax within its jurisdiction to add an additional one cent capital improvement sales and use tax. Each tax is not to exceed 1%. This addition would still require a referendum and must be approved by the majority of the voters in that county. The bill does not change anything in current law about the referendum requirement, and the referendum can only be added to a general election ballot. This impacts currently this bill. I think there's an amendment behind it, but this committee amendment impacts six counties in South Carolina, and these counties already have the tra transportation penny tax, but this bill would allow their residents to vote in a referendum to decide if they also want to employ a capital project sales tax. Um, this amendment simply adds a second code, I'm sorry, the committee amendment also updated something that was inadvertently left out of the bill, which clarifies that the referendum must take place and it must be in a general election. Um, the, this helps actually to alleviate several different things. Some of the bigger counties like Ori, for instance, it takes the burden off of our property tax payers, our residents, um, and allows the sales tax 
to be paid by some of our visitors that visit our areas. It also helps to address fast growth in some counties that surpasses what the state can keep up, what the state cannot currently keep up with in some of our smaller areas. Ms. Brawley is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm getting somewhat of clarification. It sounded pretty good, but I want to ask it anyway sure. for the benefit of others. Uh, the purpose of this additional opportunity would give those six counties the ability to have, in addition to the transportation penny tax, a capital tax. That right. You so Can the, you define for me what capital includes? Right. The transportation penny tax only covers transportation projects. Right. The capital improvement project tax includes transportation projects, but also water, fire, sewer, and public safety. Okay. So it's infrastructure. It's not, not as inclusive as the transportation just for transportation. But it's not buildings. I'm sorry? It's not buildings. Um, no. Well, it, it could be. Yes, it could be because it includes transportation projects, but also water, sewer, fire, public safety, and it could include buildings for them. Yes. All right. Thank you. It, it would not Question is adoption amendment number one. All in favor say aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Amendment number one is adopted. Clerk will read. Second amendment. Merle Smith and Pendarvis. Merle Smith and Pendarvis. Mr. Merle Smith is recognized on amendment number two. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And ladies and gentlemen, obviously we adopted this and this last amendment just affected six counties in the state. And one thing I've wondered over the years is we've got exceptions where we, we allow certain counties to have certain abilities for their voters to go and enact, uh, enact a transportation tax or a capital sales tax and we limited it. And so uh, after talking with the Association of Counties, which they agree a number of members on Ways and Means Committee, we, uh, we want this to just reflect that any county can do this. It shouldn't be limited to six counties. It shouldn't be that the largest counties in the state get the ability to have, have uh, these uh, taxes. And so this is what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Any county that wants to, that the voters want to approve a transportation tax and or a capital tax, then that's up to them. Those taxes eventually sunset as in statute and they have to be reauthorized and it's up to the voters of the county and they should be given the same opportunity. So that's all this amendment does. Question is adoption amendment number two. All in favor say aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Amendment number two is adopted. There are no further amendments. Mr. Hill requests debate. Mr. Magnuson requests debate. With that being said, the question before us is adoption of House Bill 3948. Roll call is required. 3948 is amended. Roll call is required. Voting on the board's order.
If all members wish to vote, voted. If all members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection to closing the roll call? Any objection to closing the roll call? Hearing none, clerk close the polls and tabulate. Tabulate. 7529, House Bill 3948, as amended, receives second reading. Clerk will read. House Bill 3560, Delilah Bernstein. Ways and means. Favorable. Amendment number one, which is also the committee report. Ms. Cobb Hunter is recognized on amendment number one of House Bill 3560. Ms. Cobb Hunter. Cobb Hunter's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and members, this is another bipartisan bill. I am so very grateful to be able to stand here, and particularly for our new members, just to show you that there are areas that both sides of the aisle can work on and come to terms with. Mr. Speaker and members, this bill deals with the issue of paid family leave. Um, and what we're doing here is joining countless other states and making sure that our state employees have at least some kind of fringe benefit from being state employees. Mr. Speaker and members, it's important when the pay is not what we'd like it to be that we have some other kind of fringe benefit that state employees can benefit from. Let me just tell you very briefly what this does. And Mr. Speaker, this is revolutionary, and I probably shouldn't say that word because it'll make some of y'all be scared and vote against it. So let me change and say that this is a remarkable, Colonel, piece of legislation. What it does is allow any state employee and Mr. Speaker, I've got an amendment here, so should I talk about the amendment? I think I need to talk about the amendment rather in the bill. I think that's a yes. Let me tell you what the amendment does. And we, the amendment is based on input from our department. Mr. Speaker, could we have some order so those who want to hear can hear? Ladies and gentlemen, again, if you have conversations, please take it outside. Um, it's very important. We're trying to move through this at a, at a good pace, and a lot of people want to hear it. I think this is a very important bill. Ms. Cobb Hunter is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker and members, what the amendment does is mirror Senate S-11, which is not over here yet. And so if we are successful, this bill will go across to the Senate and we will be able to deal with a House bill that is giving paid family leave. Very briefly, what this amendment does is add language as suggested by the Department of Administration so that we can make sure that we are talking about full-time equivalent employees. So there is one change which, which adds that clarity to the bill. The bill allows 12 weeks of paid family leave for either the birth or adoption of a child. There is language in the amendment which allows a full-time FTE to take the 12 weeks. The two partners, spouses, whatever, right, can take the 12 weeks. They can take it concurrently and Mr. Speaker and members, if it's not done during a calendar year, the leave will disappear. Uh, it's an excellent bipartisan show of support for families in South Carolina. I really want to commend Ms. Bernstein for her persistence in working across the aisle to get this done. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to entertain any questions that anybody might have. 
Mr. Brian White, recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Ms. Cobb Hunter, I know we had our children, I think we got six weeks, correct? Is that the current amount now, six weeks? Yes. Um, so we're getting the 12 weeks now. So if husband and wife work for the state, they can take, one can take 12 and the other one can take another 12, but not yes. 12 at the same time? They, the language allows them to do it the same time the same or time. at separate times, but they have to do it within that calendar year. Okay. So if they, they could also add annual leave plus sick time on this as well? No, uh, I believe they can, but there is language in here, and the HR departments are closely monitoring this, Mr. White, from the standpoint of the workplace capacity to make sure that any leave that is taken is consistent with the workload of that particular department. Okay, so basically, because a lot of times they accrue that annual leave or sick time and take that on top of the other six weeks some, sometimes or could potentially if you have, I'm kind of torn on this one because I really, you know, not in favor, but I can see things where, you know, there are certain state employees where you have premature births where you need time to spend. Would that be what we're trying to accomplish here or just all births? What we've tried to do in this legislation, Mr. White, is anticipate as much as possible the scenarios in which a state employee might want to take these 12 weeks of leave. We have not been as rigid as some may have liked because there are always extenuating circumstances. There is built-in transparency and accountability in this bill in that the power is with the manager of that particular department or agency to make sure that the leave is not being abused, to make sure that it is being taken consistent with the language in this bill. Okay, because we also have the, don't we still have the, the where you can bank days off, you can donate, yes. to, and folks can take that in emergency situations as well? And Mr. White, you were talking about the employee leave bank. Correct. None of paid family leave can be put into the employee paid leave, I mean the leave bank. Okay, but could they take out of that bank for the purpose of extending here if they need to after this time? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Could they take time out of that bank to apply to this if they need it? I'm not sure that they can. Uh, hold on, let me consult okay. with our staff for a minute. Can they do that? I'm told, Mr. White, that they would need to check with their respective agencies. As I mentioned, a part of the beauty of this bill is that it has allowed flexibility for managers. And so that person, that employee, would have to have a conversation with the HR manager or whoever is in charge of the, apart of the department to make sure that that is allowable. All right, thank you. And You're you have welcome. very capable staff, by the way. Sir, oh, very capable, yes, sir. Question is adoption amendment number one. All in favor say aye. All opposed? The ayes have it. Amendment number one is adopted. Clerk will read. There are no further amendments to the question before us. Is adoption House Bill 3560 as amended? Roll call is required. Vote on the board's order.
If all members wishing to vote, voted. If all members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection? Close and roll call. Any objection? Hear none, clerk, close polls and tabulate. But a 104 to 4, House Bill 3560 has many received second reading. Clerk will read. House Bill 3545 is Weston Newton. Yep. Ways and Means is passed favorably as is. Ms. Cobb Hunter is recognized to explain the, the House Bill itself, 3545. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 3545, as well as the one that follows it, is the subcommittee following the recommendation of the House Oversight Committee. And what we're doing here is simply removing references to Hunting Island residential areas that reference is being deleted because there are no longer any residential areas there. I would move for passage or adoption. Question is adoption, House Bill 3545, roll calls required, voting on the board's order. If all members wishing to vote, vote it. If all members wishing to vote, vote. Any objection to closing roll call? Any objection to closing roll call? Hear none, clerk close, polls and tabulate. Vote 106 2, House Bill 3545 received second reading. Clerk will read. The next bill is 3547. Again, Weston Newton. Ways and means favorable, as is 3547. Ms. Cobb Hunter is recognized to explain 3547. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Speaker. Ms. Speaker and members, this is a similar bill to the one that I just explained. What we're doing is trying to clean up the code and remove obsolete references to the code. This one has to do with Fort Watson Memorial and South Carolina Family Week. Again, it came from the House Oversight Committee. It's a recommendation that we do this. Uh, nobody has done Family Week in quite some time. And quite frankly, the Memorial Watson Memorial Monument is outdated. I would move adoption. Question is adoption, House Bill 3547. Roll call is required. Voting on the board's order.
If all members wishing to vote, voted. All members wishing to vote, voted. Any objection, close and roll call. Hearing none, clerk, close polls, tabulate. Vote 100 to 6, 3547, received second reading. We're now at the bottom of page nine, House Bill 3899, clerk will read. 3899. Jason Elliott, Ways and Means Favorable, with Amendment Number One. Time has expired in an uncontested period. Mr. Max Hyde moves that we recur to the morning hour. All in favor say Mr. aye. Mr. Elliott. All opposed, the ayes have it. We recur to the morning hour. We're now with Mr. Elliott to tell Mr. us Elliott. about House Bill 3899. Ms. Cobb Honor. Ms. Cobb Hunter has a Ms. Cobb Hunter will be recognized on Amendment 1. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker and members, y'all might want to pay a bit more attention to this bill. And Mr. Elliott, who is the primary author of the bill, is here to answer any questions that I am not able to answer. Mr. Speaker and members, um, this bill deals with the South Carolina Exceptional Needs Program. I'm sorry, Ms. Cobb Hunter, you hadn't asked for it, but I want to get you some order. Folks, we're on the last two pages we're trying to accomplish tonight. If you have conversations, please take them outside. I know a lot of you are just talking at your desk. If you either tone it down a little bit, please, or just take it outside. We just want to get the work done. We want to make sure everybody's here. Thanks a lot. Ms. Cobb Hunter is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I guess you noticed that your leadership over here, uh, both Double R Gary and the other Gary are the ones over here keeping up all this noise on my left. So I don't know what you can do with them, but I think you must have said the right thing because they've toned down a little bit. So this is just a, this is a bill that I quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, want the primary author to also share his thoughts on it and be able to respond to any questions. This bill was amended in subcommittee and uh, has been reported out favorably. I'll just tell you very briefly what is being done. Uh, this exceptional needs program raises from 60% to 75% state tax liability. It allows these organizations to be able to carry forward uh, the tax donor credit for three years. That's for the donor. For exceptional South Carolina, it allows up to five million in credits to be carried forward, raise the allowable operating costs from two to five percent, day-to-day uh, -day operations of the charity are to be controlled by the charity, and it eliminates the requirement to report individual student test scores, which was not allowed by federal requirement. That's basically what it does, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Just one thing, the 5% was a compromise that the subcommittee uh, reached. The original request was that it be raised to 8%. With that, Mr. Speaker, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, and then Mr. Elliott would like to be heard on the bill. Good. None. Mr. White, do you want to direct your question to, to Ms. Cobb Hunter, or do you want to wait for Mr. Elliott? Not Ms. Cobb Hunter. Okay, Ms. Cobb Hunter. Yes, sir. Stay in the hot seat. Ms. Twice, right now. Yeah, my, my good friend, Ms. Cobb Hunter, has some history, I think, with this as well, because I think you're on Ways and Means, and we had some issues with the exceptional needs, SGOs, and had to take it and put it over at the Department of Revenue. So we're, and we also reduced the percentage down to, I think, the 2%. And now we're kind of undoing a lot of what we had put in place to right the ship, so to speak. Are we now going back 
um, on what we had done before. And Mr. Because White, I'll respond, and then I'd like Mr. Elliott to respond because he will have a different opinion than I do. I think we're, we are regressing. It is unclear to me why we keep extending opportunities for this program. Um, and so I think we are regressing. There are a couple points that were troubling to me. One was what I perceived as a lack of oversight. Uh, we kind of tweaked that and fixed it a little bit. But quite frankly, I don't know how we expect to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. This exceptional children's program has been around for a few years now, as you rightly pointed out. And at one point on Ways and Means, based on complaints we had gotten from stakeholders and others involved, there were efforts made to tighten this program a bit. We did that several years ago. Yes, and as you pointed out, I'm not sure what effect this might have uh, on what we did a few years ago. Okay, because I know there were some bad actors and some things were going on and we had to right that ship. So we, we made those changes and put everybody in charge of it. I just want to make sure we're not going to undo what we had done. Um, because what I'll, concerns yeah. me, did you know, is it looks like we're putting money to the State Department. The State Department then transfers over and that was some of what we had before was well, one year you had a certain amount of money, the next year you didn't, and there was uncertainties, and there was no um, rhyme or reason as to who got how much for a scholarship. So there were some schools, and there was one in my district, did you know, that almost went bankrupt from the old system because they were giving them partial scholarships and promising them money that never showed up. But underneath the law, they had to hire and do certain things. I just want to make sure all those things are still in place and we're not going back down this slippery slope. Well, and Mr. White, you mentioned what has been for some of us the most troubling part of this, the notion of a partial scholarship and the fact that if you don't have the entire scholarship, based on the history of this scholarship granting organization, they have not been able to raise sufficient funds to offer the kinds of scholarships that were initially promised. And so there are some who believe that we are propping up a system that is destined to fail. There are also some who believe that we ought to be looking at shoring up our public school system as opposed to continuing to try to veil this program out. Yeah, and, and I like the program. I understand what's trying to be done, but there was only one group and for my friends out of Charleston with the diocese down there kind of did it right. Everybody else was doing it a little bit wrong. They made all scholarships equal amounts of money. All parents had to put in a little bit of sweat equity, whether they could afford it or not, to be able to buy into the program and do what was needed to be done. And I think that's a great thing. But there were others out there that some would get a full scholarship uh, of some places that might be seven to $10,000 and some would get $500. And there was absolutely no rhyme or reason in that part within the SGO. And I just, like I said, it, it yeah. was, and, I think it's a good thing. I just don't want to go back to where we were. Right. And this gives me a little bit of caution. And Mr. White, in fairness to the sponsors and supporters of this bill, I think their response to you would be, this bill is an effort to make sure that we don't go back to where we were. There were some bad actors, as I understand it. Uh, one, as a matter of fact, who was a part of the subcommittee hearing on this. And just as an outside observer, it was real easy to see uh, why there might be problems uh, with this. But I share your concerns. And like you, I support the program. The only problem I have with this program, as I do with any private school operation, is I don't want state tax dollars going to private schools. I'm all for private schools. Send your kid wherever you want him or her to go. But don't ask me to use tax dollars to do it. When I am a part of a district that was a part of the original Abbeville, your home county, lawsuit back in 1994, about what the state of South Carolina was not doing 
as far as equity funding for the public schools. Yeah, and did you know that I personally believe that our job is to educate children in the state of South Carolina, and it, whether it's public, home, private, we should be doing. And part of why I believed and I'm okay with state dollars going there is because we appropriate in the budget different types of grant programs that go to private universities for different grants. So to me, I'm like, well, this is a grant of grant. We're using state dollars or whatever, whether it's directly or diverted through tax credits. Um, so I'm fine with that part. I just want to make sure we don't get back down that slippery slope because, as you know, our uh, former colleague, Mr. Representative Bingham, and I took a lot of heat for taking it from the slippery slope to where we are today. So I just want to make sure that wasn't done in vain. And Mr. White, let me commend you for sliding that little point in about private colleges receiving funding. And I would share with you that I certainly make a distinction between higher ed, private higher ed institutions, and K through 12 public institutions. But I commend you for the way you ease that right on in. Um, well, you get, you I got, tell you, you get, that requires skill. As you and said, you that display. tide rises all ships, and it starts at the bottom and goes to the higher ed level. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Govan is recognized for a question. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Carmohunter, am I to understand then that this exceptional needs, first of all, particularly for those who may not be familiar with it, who are they referring to when they talk about exceptional needs of children? As I understand it, Mr. Govan, exceptional needs are the, are the same, it's the same category as students with uh, special needs and other kinds of disabilities. Okay, then. I think. So basically, presently, we are providing $12 million uh, to parents who have, of special needs children to attend private school yes. who don't want to participate mm -hmm. in the public school system. Is that correct? Yes, Ms. sir. Ms. Cobb Hunter, uh, that's your first 10 minutes, ma'am. Ms. Speaker, I'm going to allow Mr. Elliott to come and speak, and if I need to come back for my second 10, I will. Right. Yes, ma'am. No, I'm, I'm, sure? yeah, sure. okay. Mr. Elliott is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, um, Chair Lady Cobb Hunter. Uh, we're right. We can't keep doing the same thing in this program and expecting it to even continue. If we don't do something to improve the program, and this is what this bill is all about, this program that provides tax credits, non-state dollars, but tax credits to parents to be able to send their children with special needs, like folks who have students who have IEPs, uh, to the school of uh, their choice in, around the state, and 35 of the 46 counties have students who participate in this program. So it's a good chance that most, almost everyone in here will have a student who participates in, in the program. Uh, so Mr. Govan, to your, to your, I think your question would be, yeah, right now, $12 million a year are allowed in tax credits. The, the problem is right now that last year, they only raised $4 million in tax credits. So this bill tries to improve the program, to incentivize donors to contribute, and to help stabilize the program and get it up and running so that it can fully uh, fund what it would be able to if they collected all the $12 million. So the, the, the monies that are being collected from the these donors are coming from the private sector, I take it. Uh, how does that money, uh, that money comes to the state through the, the, the uh, is it directed directly to the State Department? You have the. And the State Department is a flow through? You, or, or are we actually contributing state dollars to this program? No, sir. No state dollars. What it, it's, a, it's a tax credit. An individual or a corporation or an LLC can give up to the limit of $12 million a year. The exceptional SC, which is a, a nonprofit, goes out and collects the money. DOR confirms the amount of credits that are available. Then the, the exceptional needs nonprofit awards the scholarship. So to Mr. White's point a minute ago, they were uh, presently they've been only able they haven't been able to commit 
to the full amount of the scholarship, which would be allowed because in the 2019-20 school year, they only raised 3.7 million in tax credits. They granted 4.5 because they had some money left over. This year, they've only raised today 300,000. So it's a program that has existed in proviso form since 2013. We codified it in 2017. And this is just to improve the program and to stabilize it. Because if we don't, and it does good things. I have a lot of schools in Greenville County, kids with autism and other special needs, that they are getting the help they need and it's a shame that the kids in 35 counties across South Carolina, that they're not going to be able to get the education that's working for them because we're not able to raise the tax credits. And this is what this bill does. It keeps the, the, the formula in place that allows the exceptional SC um, charity to administer this. And uh, I believe it's critically important. If we don't do it, the, these, this is going to go away, I think. Okay. I, I, and I like Rep Representative Cobb Hunter. I think, you know, if, if you, if you want to... Send your kid to private school. And rock, yeah. If that's what rocks your boat, that's fine. I, I guess so we're trying to keep that line there between funding using public dollars to fund. For, for this, this, because is no, this is no public I was, dollars. I was looking at the bill here, and in the heading it says that, and, and just to give you an opportunity yeah. to explain it, this is not an attack on anything, but I just need some clarification. It just says to appropriate $12 million to the Department of Education so the department may make a donation of $12 million to exceptional South Carolina. And that's a good point, Representative Goodman, that the summary of the bill is wrong. It doesn't appropriate any state dollars. In fact, the physical impact statement, as you'll see, is actually a, a revenue um, added to the, to the uh, general fund. It, it doesn't cost, it doesn't take any money out of the, the state coffers. Okay, and, and my final no. question is this. Um, and, 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 and certainly this is, this is just a concern as a, a, a longtime member of the House Education Committee. Uh, since this, did not, this portion did not come through the House Education Committee regarding the removing a provision that requires a school to provide certain individual student test scores in its application, would you care to explain that? Because I, I think that is very important. Good, good and that's point. something that probably should have come to the House good, Education good point, Committee. Mr. Good point, Mr. Govan, on the applicability of that provision. Right now, each school that participates in the program yearly has to report to the Education Oversight Committee. In fact, they are able to authorize which schools can participate. 133 schools are eligible to participate. 106 schools did participate this past year. And they have to provide data um, on their accreditation and their uh, participation in the program every year to the EOC. What we are removing, there was a requirement that was added in 2018 that individualized student data had to be reported. The nonprofit compiled that, but because of federal law, they could not turn over individual test scores to the, for the students. So they had to do it, but yet they couldn't report it. So that is a requirement that is not, they're not allowed to, to report individualized test scores. And so that's why we're removing that. So it removes an obligation that they, under federal regulations, cannot comply with. Mr. Ott, recognized for quick. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Elliott, just trying to get a little bit better understanding, um, I, I see that we are going to now allow for up to 5% of this money to be used for the administration of the program. That's up from 2%, but down from the original 8% Yep. That, that came out of committee, is that correct? Yeah, the, the, committee, the committee amendment, which will be the bill, raises the operating cost that, that the, the nonprofit can use from 2% to 5%. Okay, so, so you're, you're, so, so you're correct. 5%, so we, what we learned, that's one of the major reasons they can't function as they're supposed to now. I, I don't know any nonprofit that operates on 2%. You look at their 990s. I don't know any nonprofit that operates off 2%. I don't know any business that operates off 2%. So as Mr. White uh, mentioned before, we lowered it years ago for some concerns of what was happening in the program, but now we've ratcheted down too strongly and they can't operate on the 2%. So they would need the fight. This is, allows them to go out and raise the money. The goal of this is so they can go out and raise the money to reach the max level of tax credits of $12 million per year. 
Right. So, so we're talking we're, we're talking five percent of twelve million dollars. Is that correct? So it, it, they could utilize five percent of, of whatever they raise. Yeah, to operate the program up to twelve million dollars. Yes. So let's just use that. So we're talking six hundred thousand yep. dollars for administration yep. and, 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 and for to raise the funds and that sort of thing. Right. Yep. And, and, but but it's paying for more than just raising funds. So what exactly does that administration go to? How many how many people do they have on staff running running the nonprofit? Yep. Right now they don't have any. Because they Excuse can't, me? right now they don't have any because they can't pay them. So it's it's a it's a board that we appoint. The the uh, chairman of Ways and Means appoints two board members. Uh, Senate uh, Finance Chairman appoints two, and the governor appoints one. So it's a five member board. Right now they don't have any employees working there because they can't pay them to raise the money. So they're doing it. They're, they're volunteers. I don't even think they get per right. deal. But and so it would it would be used to. We're not having a problem raising the money, are we? Yeah. That's yeah, we kind are. of my whole point. Yeah, we are having a problem raising the money. Yeah. So, so, what what have we been raising? This last year they raised, uh, they raised um, three. They raised five million last year. The year before they raised twelve million, and this year so far they've raised three hundred thousand. And because in two thousand eighteen we changed it from the from the five percent to the two percent, and then also the federal tax law changed which made it a disadvantage for the program and what they're raising the money. So right. there were less I, I, people contributing. You know, I guess that's just my concern, Mr. Elliott, is, is it doesn't seem that we have too many parameters. We're, we're simply saying that you're going to be able to spend 5%. Yeah. But, I mean, 5%, I, if we go out and hire one person and pay one person $600,000, obviously that's not going to be a, you know, well, that's, that's not have, what we intended. No. I'm just trying to figure out if... You know, are we going to have any parameters? I don't, I don't want to, you know, read an article later on down the road that yep. what we're voting on is intended to try to get, you know, special needs children, which I have supported historically, yeah. um, you know, to try to make sure that they have scholarships and that the, the, the families can be able to pay for them to get into some of these schools, you know, the, not, not trying to um, provide some positions that, that people can, can, can make a lot of money off the, of. The whole goal is to raise money. Give you an example. In Georgia, they have a $100 million program. And for the first 10 million, I believe, that, that, uh, that a funding organization can raise, they can utilize 8% of that on operating costs. Thank you, Mr. Elliott. So. Mr. Robert Williams, recognized for a question. Okay. Mr. Taylor, recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Elliott, this program, we've debated this program over the years when it first got initiated. Um, you know, I believe it to be extremely valuable. Would you say that these students that we're talking about are the single most vulnerable kids? Would you agree? Thank you. Because um, I'm asking questions here because I have to. Um, Mr. Taylor, before we roll in the question, uh, Mr. Taylor, that's your first 10 minutes. You want your second, sir? Yes. Yes. Mr. Elliott's recognized Ms. Taylor continued question, sir. Thank you. These are the most vulnerable kids. Um, would you agree that in the, in the schools, the public schools, we heard much testimony about this over the years, there's just no help for them in the public schools. This has been a very special program that has been, in my view, hugely successful. So you, you had to do it. It was hard to hear you in here a bit, but you did the numbers before. The numbers, did they not show that they were extremely successful in reaching the, the credit, uh, the, the amount that we set as the legislature? Like, it was, I think, $8 million the first year or two, and then it went to $12 million. And they met that easily, didn't they? Yes, sir. They, they did before um, COVID. Before COVID. COVID. This is a COVID crisis. Time. No, this is a COVID crisis, and we've got kids that are the most needy caught in the crosshairs of a COVID crisis. Sounded to me, did you say that the, the federal tax laws change didn't help anything either? Correct. So this doesn't address, obviously, or does this somehow make it easier for them to contribute? Yes, it incentivizes the donor to contribute, and it helps the program to, to uh, become sustainable. Yes. It, it, wouldn't we all know in business that the only way you're going to go out and get that kind of money is to go out and sell for it? In other words, 
convince people to contribute that money. It really worked well, didn't it, for a number of years? Yes, sir, it did. And did they not also have a huge waiting list? They did have a waiting list. And in fact, at one point, at their highest, they were able to accommodate 2,300 students across the state. This past year, at very meager amounts of scholarships awarded, they were only able to help 1,300 students. Wow, so almost half of the students that they were able to help by your numbers, but also the number of students that applied, the families that applied, and I've met with those families. This, is, this has been a godsend program to these families. Um, they had people, families, waiting to get in, did they not? Correct. And that's why we raised it from eight million to 12 million. Now when you said the startling number, when you said 300,000 this year or something like that, that's heartbreaking. So I'm all for this. We got to fix it. We got to fix it for these kids. This is about those kids in a COVID crisis. I, I agree. And if we don't fix it, I believe the program will not be around to fix. Thank you. Ms. Brawley's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you, Representative Elliott, for taking my questions. Uh, just so that I'm understanding correctly, the money that this entity operates off of comes from tax credits? Yes, ma'am. And those tax credits are a part of what I presume individuals and or businesses decide they want to award to that particular program? Yes, ma'am. And for the last several years, several years, there has been a lack of meeting their financial goal to serve the students. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And now we are being asked to increase the amount of the potential set aside for the tax credit. Is that correct? No, no, no ma'am. We're, we're at with the tax, the allowable tax credit will remain the same at 12 million per year. So what are we, what are, what are you attempting to do with this bill? Attempting to, incent, to help stabilize the program and improve the program, to incentivize donors to give, and to help the program to be able to raise more money. So by incentivizing, you mean that the persons or entities that are giving the money will get a, a larger tax credit? Y yes, ma'am. Well, well, they won't get a larger tax credit. Right now, the, the nonprofit that can raise the money for these tax credits can utilize 2% of what they raise to operate on. And that's a near impossibility. So we're raising that to 5% as to what they can operate on. So that, that's the, 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 and there'll be a carry forward too of the tax credit. It doesn't raise the limit, but it, and if they ever get in a good year again and they raise in excess of 12 million, they can carry forward five, year, five million for that. So would you not say that because the desire on the part of those individuals and or businesses to contribute to this program, isn't that the marketplace deciding that this is not the most effective way to deal with this program and to deal with those students? No, I don't think so. And, and you know, it, 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 you know it, it bothered me at first when I thought about that people weren't just being altruistic and giving for exceptional needs kids, but this program is to help the most vulnerable of our students across South Carolina. And if a taxpayer, if they're giving because they get a tax credit or that they get a benefit from that, I, I don't think it speaks to the program. It just speaks to the program to be able to market effectively and, and to raise the credits. Exactly. So th my point precisely that obviously the marketplace is not responding to the level that you think is necessary to function for the program to function. What I don't, what I know that we haven't done is give the entity the uh, exceptional needs uh, charity the ability to go out and raise the funds, and this bill would do that. But haven't they had problems with this particular charity? I've been reading some very discouraging headlines and articles about management of that nonprofit and how much of the nonprofit's money was actually going to salaries. No, uh, it was going to, um, they have to, they were able to, use, they, the point is, they, can, they had to use more than the 2% because they can't operate on 2%. That proves the point of the bill and the necessity of it, that there's no way that they can operate this business on 2%. And that's why we're here today. So we're saying, we're gonna raise it. You couldn't make the 2%, we're raising it to 5%. We're increasing the amount of credit that the business or individual gets, even though people are shying away from contributing 
obviously from the amount of money I, I, that they're receiving. You, you just mentioned three hundred thousand yeah. dollars. I, I, I get your point. I, I, I get your point on this, but my, my point is that they're unable to operate their charity, which is their business in this, for for the um, special needs kids of South Carolina that would fit into this program. That they don't have the wherewithal to do that, and this bill would allow them to do that. Did you know that in the public school system, there are, and I mean this literally, thousands, tens of thousands of students with individual education programs, IEPs. Correct. Unlike what was previously mentioned, that there is no place for these children to be served and that the public schools have essentially turned their back away from them. The, the school districts do a, a, a great job of what they have yes. and the resources. The school district of Greenville County does a good job. These, this program allows the parents to decide the best educational opportunity for their kids. And for these, at one point, 2,200 kids around South Carolina, they were able to do that. And I'm supportive of that. And I'm supportive of, of public schools. So thank you. Ms. Felder is recognized. Thank you, Representative, and thank you for taking the time to answer my question. I am looking at the fiscal impact statement from yes, March the 12th. Can you explain what the organi organizational structure will be now? It will be the same organizational structure. It'll be, it'll be a board that will be appointed two by this body, two by the other body, and one by the governor. The bill makes changes to the organizational structure of Exceptional SC, which is the public charity that manages the board of directors of the charity will no longer be appointed by the House Ways and Means, the Senate Finance. Can I, if I, I can simplify it right here, the committee amendment restores that. The committee amendment. The, okay, the, so your committee me, amendment well, restores after the fiscal impact. The, the, way, the Ways and Means Committee um, restores that, yeah. And it took the, it says the bill also increases the amount of fund that may be retained by the charity for administration and related costs from 2% to 8 yes, and the committee two, amendment takes it back to 5? 2% to 5, and that's what we've been talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Robinson's recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you also, Mr. Elliott. And I just couldn't sit back in my seat without expressing to you how heartbreaking it is for me to recall when this bill first came before us. And I believe at that time, Representative Eric Bedenfield was a part of the leadership uh, for this bill. And the reason it's so heartbreaking to me is because when this bill was first introduced, I had an interest in it, and I still do, uh, coming from Greenville County and having served for nearly 16 years on Greenville School Board. I knew that this program was very much needed. But at the time it was introduced, Representative Bettenfield also had added to the bill the fact that this program would serve these beautiful, exceptional children, but that it would also serve poor and disadvantaged minority students. So I would like to request debate on this so we can explore whether or not moving forward we could add those disadvantaged poor and minority students since, as I recall, the budget is triple what it was when it first began so that we can serve more students. I request debate. Thank you. Ms. Robinson requests debate. Ms. Brawley requests debate. Mr. Govan requests debate. Mr. Pendarvis requests debate. Mr. Kilyard requests debate. Ms. McDaniel requests debate. Ms. Matthews requests debate. Mr. King requests debate. Mr. Elliott requests debate. Mr. Gary Smith requests debate. Mr. Anderson requests debate. Ms. Robinson requests debate. Ms. Dillard requests debate. Ms. Hennigan requests debate. Mr. Willis requests debate. Ms. Trantham requests debate. 
Ms. Jones requests debate. Mr. Stringer requests debate. Ms. Bennett requests debate. Mr. Morgan requests debate. Mr. Ott requests debate. Ms. Erickson requests debate. Mr. Herb Kirschman requests debate. Ms. Crawford requests debate. Mr. Hosey requests debate. Mr. J.L. Johnson requests debate. Mr. Rivers requests debate. Mr. Shadron Williams requests debate. Ms. Garvin requests debate. Mr. Rose requests debate. Ms. K.O. Johnson requests debate. Mr. Jefferson requests debate. I believe that will probably move that to the contested count. Mr. Magnuson, for what purpose do you rise? Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, having voted on the prevailing side of 3547, I move to reconsider the vote whereby that bill was adopted. Um, my understanding was it was in regards to Fort Watson and um, a benign portion of law um, been informed that it actually repealed uh, Family Week in South Carolina. And so I'd like to move to reconsider the vote. 3547. We're on House Bill 3547. It's on the bottom of page nine. A bill to amend the Code of Laws, South Carolina, 1976, is amended by repealing Chapter 9 of Title 51 relating to Fort Watson Memorial and by repealing Section 53390 and 53100, both relating to Family Week in South Carolina. Ms. Cobb Hunter, for what purpose do you rise? Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to respond to what I thought was a point of order uh, that, Mr. that he just raised. Uh, it was not, I wanted to respond to his inquiry and let him know that he has some misinformation, uh, that all of this was based on information from PRT, and that Family Week has been more than two decades before it's been celebrated. I'm not sure, I may have misheard him. And it came from legislative oversight, Mr. Speaker. So I'm assuming. I'm sorry, Ms. Cobbler. Give me one second. We've occurred more than an hour, and then we'll take about and we'll do it. Right. 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 Time has expired in the uncontested period. Mr. Hickson moves that we've recurred the morning hour. All in favor say aye. All opposed? Okay, the motion before us is having voted on the prevailing side, Mr. Magnuson wishes to reconsider his vote or reconsider the vote on House Bill 3547. Ms. Cobb Hunter, this is a debatable motion. If you would like to approach and speak on this issue, you're welcome to do so. Likewise, Mr. Magnuson, everyone's welcome, welcome to be heard. Uh, it is a debatable motion. I just want to make sure we're doing it in the proper form versus questions from the desk. Mr. Speaker, thank you so much, and I apologize for being out of order. I was trying to understand what Mr. Magnuson was saying. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to clarify for him and others who may have the same, same concern. A couple of points I think are important here. We created the Legislative Oversight Committee so that it could look, uh, do what we call a drilling down and all the weeds and look at what is going on in these agencies and what does not need to go on. Mr. Newton and his committee, in their infinite wisdom, worked with Parks, Recreation, and Tourism on this Fort Watson Memorial issue. It was at the suggestion of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism that this be deleted because two points. One, every week 
in South Carolina is Family Week. There is no need to designate a separate week. The other point is while every week is Family Week here in South Carolina, the reality is as far as Fort Watson is concerned, it's been more than two decades before, I mean, since any, obs any observance of Family Week at this memorial has been held. And so PRT, in their conversations with Mr. Newton and his committee, decided that it would be in the best interest of our state codes for us to eliminate what has been deemed obsolete language because this being such a Christian state and a family value state every week is family violence, I mean is family week. Um, that's all I want to say, Mr. Speaker. I don't know if that helped. I think the chair of, of the committee is trying to answer what questions he might have, but at the appropriate time, I am going to move to table uh, his motion. So the question before us is motion to reconsider House Bill 3547. Ms. Cobb Hunter moves to table. Do you wish to be heard, Mr. Magnuson? Mr. Magnuson is recognized to be heard on this matter. Um, Mr. Magnuson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And um, uh, so just two things, the reason that I raised this objection, um, Mr. McCravey drew to my attention that uh, what we voted, what I, I thought we voted on wasn't what uh, the completion of what uh, I actually voted on. So I think it's very important in this body as we plow through our bills that we are aware of what we're voting on and, and can take a really good up or down vote on it. Um, I, uh, talk to uh, Chairman Newton, and I appreciate his points. Um, I still am going to to stick with my motion to reconsider the vote, just because I think we need a good vote on this section of law, which I think uh, Representative McCravey will read to you. And uh, I do believe that having something like Family Week in South Carolina is a great idea. And I think that um, the way that it's written in uh, in the current law and in the notes associated with the current law, um, th those are good things, and we need to keep. Uh, the understanding that the family matters in South Carolina. Um, we're in a time when the idea of the family is so uh, attacked in, uh, from a lot of directions. And so I don't think that now is the time to be uh, taking that out of uh, our rules and, uh, and out of uh, the recognition by state agencies. So I'm going to, uh, at the appropriate time, ask for a roll call on, uh, on this section. I appreciate your attention. Mr. McCravey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just briefly, you know, as I, as I look through this, and the Fort Watson part of this may be legit, and I'm sure it is, but to do away with Family Week because the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism doesn't like it, to me, is the wrong way to go. You know, the preamble starts out in this, whereas throughout the history of the United States, the family unit, along with church and schools, has been the most important institution in the development of the strength and prosperity of the nation. Whereas it seems that America's family influence on the national scene is lessening because of a deterioration of the cohesiveness of the family. And this goes on to designate one week as Family Week in South Carolina. Now, and it, and it directs the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism to develop a plan to promote the celebration of this one week in South Carolina. I see absolutely nothing wrong with that, and to me, the Department of Parks and Recreation and Tourism needs to do what the law says for them to do, to promote that one week in South Carolina. Now, you know, to say that we don't need that week because we have it every week in South Carolina, that's like saying we don't need Veterans Day because we love our veterans every day in South Carolina. We still need to recognize the role of the family in this state, so that's all I had to say. Thank you. Mr. Weston Newton's recognized. Do I need to, you want some I don't. I don't care. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let me just briefly, you all have heard me stand up here at the well before and talk about recommendations that come from the Legislative Oversight um, Committee. And one of our uh, roles and responsibilities is to identify obsolete portions of the law or portions of the law that have never been used um, and that often folks are not sure why they were even put in um, to the law. Um, Section 53-3-90 of the South Carolina Code of Laws that was enacted in 1978 uh, provides that the last week of August in each year shall be declared Family Week in South Carolina. The folks that work for PRT have said that for more than two decades, this has never happened. They do not develop a plan to emphasize the use of our parks for one week a year. They promote the use of our parks for families all 52 weeks a year. So this is not an effort to attack family values, quite the contrary. But it is part of the overall effort as we look at the code and identify those provisions of law that are never utilized or that have not been utilized. In fact, under sworn testimony, the agency personnel from PRT couldn't tell us that this had ever been done in anybody's history while they were there. They weren't saying that it shouldn't be done. What they were saying is that this designation says let's just have one week for families, not all 52 weeks a year, and they quite frankly don't want to be in violation of the law. Furthermore, the Complementary Section 53-3-100 creates a committee to choose a single family in South Carolina to be South Carolina Family of the Year. I wonder if anybody in this room can tell me who was the last family of the year and when they were picked, because PRT says it's been more than 20 years since there have been any family that's been picked. I bet if you ask the governor's office who he appoints to this committee, um, he can't answer that question of the folks that serve on this committee that have four-year terms, one member appointed by the governor, one member appointed by the head of each of the following agencies, PRT, Department of Youth Services, South Carolina Commission on Aging, Department of Social Services, Commission on Alcohol Drug Abuse, Department of Agriculture, Clemson College Extension Service, four-year terms, serve until their successors are appointed, and the expenses of the committee must be paid by PRT. So to suggest that in any way this is an attack on family values because there happens to be preamble language in the editor's note is the farthest thing from the truth. Quite frankly, this is an obsolete provision of the law. And if we believe that this ought to be done, then let's vote against uh, repealing it. And let's go about the process of making sure that it gets done. But our agencies have identified something that's not being done. Our elected officials and these agencies that are supposed to be appointing and selecting a single family of the year aren't doing it. Um, and this matter was brought forward based on the recommendation of the Legislative Oversight Committee to do that. So with that, I would commend to you, I think that this legislation has been voted on in the past here. Um, Fort Watson Memorial is part of one of the two statutes identified to be repealed as they currently exist in the books. And if we think family, promoting a family of the year is appropriate, obviously this mechanism isn't working, working or has not been utilized. Let's find another way to appropriately do so. Thank you. Again, the question before us is reconsideration of the vote for House Bill 3547. Ms. Cobb Hunter moves to table that request. Mr. Magnuson requests a roll call on the tabling motion. Do nine members second? Nine members do. Question before us is tabling of the motion for reconsideration. Roll call is required. Voting on the board order.
All members wishing to vote, vote it. Any objection to closing a roll call? Any objection to closing a roll call? Hearing none, the clerk close poll and tabulate. By vote of 70 39, the motion table passes. Motion is tabled. Page 10, House Bill 3354, Clerk will read. Page 10, 3354 is Mr. Ballantyne's bill, which passed the Ways and Means Committee favorably in its original state. Mr. Gary Smith is recognized to explain the bill, 3354. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the uh, House, 3354 deals with property tax exemption on renewable energy resource properties having a nameplate capacity of and operating at no greater than 20 kilowatts. Ms. Brawley, what does that mean? That means solar panels on homes. It's basically what that means. <clears throat> this is uh, something that has, been being ta has not been taxed by counties. Uh, the county association spoke at the uh, hearing and agreed uh, that not to object to the bill and to support the bill since they weren't uh, taxes in it uh, now. And, Mr. Speaker, there's no question I'd move for, a, for approval. And we have a hand up for question. I don't see a question, Mr. Smith. Oh, I do. I'm sorry. Mr. Pendarvis right in front of me, and he is recognized. Mr. Pendarvis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for taking my question. Yes, sir. Just a couple points of clarification. Um, are, are you saying that homes with solar panels currently are not taxed? Or, or not, uh, is that what you're saying? The solar panels and the equipment the, for operation of it is not taxed currently, yes, sir. So the equipment, not the actual property? Correct. Okay. And not so, the property itself. Okay. And this bill would do what now? This bill will put that in the statute. Okay, so it's it basically codifies what this, what's already taking place. It's being done right now in the uh, Association of Counties. It, it says that it's being done right now, and they do not object to it can, being put into a statute. Has there ever been a push to tax that equipment or, um, or property? Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. Okay, just wanted to clarify. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pendarvis. Pending question is, second reading, House Bill 3354. Roll calls require an order to we'll vote on the board. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Yes, ma'am.
Call members, please to vote, vote in. Our time's about to expire. If all members wish to vote, vote in. Time has expired. Pulls the close. Clerk will tabulate. By a vote of 174, House Bill 3354 receives second reading by the body. Taking us to House Bill 3482, Clerk will read. The next bill. 3482, Leonidas Stavronakis, ways and means favorable as is. All right, Ms. Smith is recognized on the bill. Here, is that better? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, uh, what this bill does is to allow those counties, allow counties to take into vary the dates in the application process for uh, implementation of collections and in installments of back taxes, not current taxes, but back taxes. That's currently being done right now. It has specific dates and so forth for the application process. It allows them to take into uh, the very those dates on those uh, installment plans. Mr. Speaker, there's no questions. I move for adoption. By the way, the Association of Counties is in support of this also. And Mr. Herb Kersman has a question, and he is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Representative Smith, just a quick question. How does that affect, affect the uh, tax sales? Uh, it does not affect the tax sales. They still got to get those things done before uh, the, uh, the tax sales, but it allows them to take into vary those installments uh, within the specific, is that, is that correct? We're doing the specific times that they have now, dates. It still has to be done within the year, but it gives them a little bit of flexibility within that year on the installments. Okay, thank you. Pending question is, second reading on House Bill 3482. Roll calls require an order. We'll vote on the board. If all members wish to vote, vote in. <laughs> Time's about to expire. If all members wish to vote, vote in. Time's expired. Polls are closed. Call to tabulate. A vote of 110 to 0. House Bill 3482 receives second reading. Take us to the bottom of page 10. House Bill 4064. Clerk will read. 4064. Merle Smith and Sandibill. Ways and means. Favorable with amendment number one, which is also the committee report. 
All right, Mr. Smith is recognized on Amendment 1, the committee report. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start by explaining the uh, bill itself. Otherwise, the amendment's not going to make any sense to you. Uh, the bill clarifies property tax exemption put in place for manufacturing property in the roads bill, a.k.a. the gas tax bill. Uh, that exclusively applies to manufacturers and not to utilities, even if the utility property is used for manufacturing. Uh, the statute applies a 14.2857% of the property tax value for manufacturing property is exempt and sets a reimbursement by the state up to $85 million a year for this purpose. What the amendment does it says that any utilities that have utilized this must apply those dollars to rate relief of their customers. That's what the amendment does. So with that, Mr. Speaker, I'll be happy to answer any questions. If not any questions, I'll be happy to take and to make a motion to approve the amendment. Pending question is the adoption of Amendment 1. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. Clerk will read. No further amendments. There being no further amendments, and Mr. Smith having explained the bill as he explained Amendment 1, the pending question is second reading on House Bill 4064 as amended by the body. Roll calls require an order. We'll vote on the board. All members wishing to vote, voted. Time's about to expire. All members wishing to vote, voted. Time's expired. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. By a vote of 112 to 0, House Bill 4064, as amended by the body, receives second reading. Taking us still to the top of page 11, House Bill 4106, Clerk will read. 4106, Mr. Finlay, without reference. Mr. Smith is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, we call, were called this bill to uh, deal with the tax uh, filing, the deadline that was pushed back by the IRS to May 15th, and we did that before we adjourned. Uh, what we've come to learn is that DOR has, has uh, gone ahead and extended that, so it's not necessary for us to have this amendment, uh, have this resolution. So I move to recommit this, or to commit this bill to Ways and Means. Mr. Smith moves to recommit House Bill 4106 to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor say aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. Bill is recommitted to the House Ways and Means Committee. Withdrawal of Jackson's request for debate. Mr. Ott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, request withdrawing my objection from H3465.
Thank you, Mr. Ott. Give me a minute. Mr. Ott withdraws his objection to House Bill 3465. Charles, let me know when you're ready. Further withdrawal objections on that bill. Mr. Kirby on that bill. Ms. Cobb Hunter on that bill. All right. Well, Mr. Reed, I'm going to slow down. Ms. Brawley's next. When you get ready for me to say Ms. Brawley's name, I will say it. Ms. Brawley. Mr. King. I understand. Further withdrawal of objections on this bill. Charles's cross today is made of heavy oak, not balsam. Withdrawal of objections on other bills. Seeing none, unanimous consent request, Mr. Govan. Unanimous consent to recall Senate Bill 515 from the Orangeburg County Legislative Delegation to be put on the calendar. What's it do, Mr. Govan? Uh, this bill deals with uh, Orangeburg County and making some changes in the language dealing with consolidation. Okay, so it deals with school districts in Orangeburg it's, it's County? with the school district. And we just want to put it on the calendar. We do have Representative Ott has an amendment. Mr. Govan, the clerk informs me that that bill has already, that that has already been put, reported out of committee. I'm going to read it across the desk so it'll be on the calendar tomorrow. Okay. In terms of his Further unanimous consent requests. Hearing and seeing none, we go to vetoes. House Bill 3584, middle of page 11, clerk will read. You okay? Communication from Governor Henry McMaster to James H. Lucas. Dear Mr. Speaker, members of the House, I'm vetoing without my approval, House Bill 3584. Mr. Sanford is recognized to explain the veto. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the House. This bill is for Oconee County only. It's the Board of Assessment Appeals. Appeals. This board had not really been changed in any way since the mid-1970s. We made a few changes just so that it made sense as to how the appointments were drawn. I ask that you uh, override the veto. Thank you, Mr. Sander. For the pending question, shall the act become law? The veto of His Excellency the Governor to the contrary notwithstanding, we vote green to override, we vote red to sustain, but we always vote on the board for vetoes. All right, House will be in order during the roll call period. All right, this is the Ori delegation. House will be in order. Mr. Fry is recognized to speak on behalf of the delegation. Sands, Mr. Britton. Mr. Fry. 
Thank you, Speaker. You know, while we were away on furlough last week, um, one of our colleagues from Horry County, Mr. Case Britton, had a birthday. I think he turned 55. <laughs> and, and if you ask Case, he's a young member, but he's kind of ambitious up here, and uh, he will tell you that he has the most luxurious hair of any member of the General Assembly. Um, <laughs> And although that might be the case, Mr. Simrel is the only person in this chamber that looks like Kenny Powers from Eastbound and Down. So to that we say, uh, I think he takes the cake, but happy belated birthday to our colleague from Myrtle Beach, Case Britton. Okay, stand up, let us give you a big birthday round of applause. Mark Willis, Case Britton, and Gary Simmel vying for the most luxurious hair in the South Carolina General Assembly. Time, sir. Time's expired. Polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. By the vote of 95 to 5, the veto of the governor is overridden. That takes us to concurrent resolutions. We're on the bottom of page 11, House Bill 4011. Clerk will read. 4. 011, Cheney Nay Erickson, Department of Transportation, George J. Jordy Madlinger III Bridge. Beautiful delegation, we ready to go? All those in favor of House Bill 4011 say aye. Oppose nay. The ayes have it. House has adopted House Bill 4011. Taking us to the bottom of page 11, House Bill 4018, Clerk will read. 4018 Will Wheeler. 4018 is DOT naming Bonnie Holiday Way. Sir. Mr. Wheeler, Mr. Dabney, we ready to go on this? Okay. All right, this is House Bill 4018. Bonnie Holiday Way in Kershaw County, South Carolina. All those in favor say aye. Opposed no, the ayes have it. House has adopted current resolution 4018. That takes us to page 12. Uh, concurrent resolution 4025, Clerk will read. Representative Jefferson, Angie Lee Crumb Crossing. All right, Dorchester County, we ready to go? All those in favor? Current resolution 4025, say aye. Opposed, no, the ayes have it. Houses adopted, H4025. And the last current con concurrent resolution on the calendar is 4043, page 12. I ask Mr. Cromer to read. 4043 by Robert Quarantine Williams, Darlington County, Terrence Carraway Memorial Highway. Mr. Williams, Darwin and Florence ready to go on this? All right. All those in favor of House Bill 4043 say aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it. House is adopted. House Bill 4043. Mr. Hickson moves to recur to the morning hour. All in favor say aye. Opposed no. The ayes have it. All right, members, house will be in order. I'm going, I'm going to read now, and many of you have asked me about some of the things we have on the desk. So I'd ask you all to please pay attention. If you don't have an interest in what's going to be read across the desk, please um, be silent so the members who are trying to hear can listen. Mr. Cromer. Communication from Henry McMaster to the members of the House. I am hereby transmitting with... Appointment for confirmation, statewide reappointment, Department of Transportation, North Myrtle Beach. Communicate. All right, members, house will be in order. 
House will be in order. The governor is appointing Tony K. Cox of 817 St. Charles Road, North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Um, to the Department of Transportation Commission. It requires confirmation of both the House and the Senate. The governor's appointment is before us for confirmation. We will vote on the board. Pending question, confirmation, Mr. Tony K. Cox is the governor's appointment from the 7th Congressional District. Yes, sir, Mr. King. Mr. Speaker, I just have a question in reference to the appointments that the governor sends to us. As do we get a copy of a resume or something to know who we're voting on? Well, um, Mr. King, the last time we had confirmation was for the ethics committee, I believe, and Mr. Jordan came up and gave us a biography of the individual, but that's an appointment um, from the House. I believe it has to be approved by the House, approved by the Ethics Commission. Um, yeah. I, if the body desires, I could refer it to the Education Committee, and they can they can review the appointment. I, I just all right, asked. All right. Um, out of an abundance of caution, I'm going to refer this appointment to the House Education Committee and let them review it. Refer to education. Clerk Reed. House Regulations, Clemson University. Seed certification. Regulations. House Regulations, LLR, Emergency Temporary Work Permits. Regulations. Communications, message from the Senate. Mr. Speaker, members of your honorable body, we non concurrent amendments, you propose to 3589. All right, House Bill 3589, Ms. Allison insists on the House amendments and the chair appoints Representative Allison Felder and Alexander as the House conferees. Senate amendments to House Bill 3011. All right, members, we're on Senate amendments. Ms. Allison asked for unanimous consent that we take up the Senate amendments now. Is this the um, driving lane bill? This is it. Ms. Allison asked for unanimous consent to take up the Senate amendments. Hearing no objection, this is House Bill 3011. Ms. Allison is going to tell us what the Senate has done and tell us what she recommends. Ms. Allison is recognized. Ms. Allison is recognized to tell us what the Senate has done to the House bill. Thank House, you, Mr. House will be in order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this is Mr. West's bill, and to be perfectly honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, the Senate completely changed the bill. They, um, they went into a third lane instead of two lane situation, so we want to non-concur with this and go to conference committee.
All right, Ms. Allison asked that we non-concur to the Senate amendments on 3011. We'll vote on the board. Roll calls required and ordered. Vote red to non-concur. You vote green to concur. All members wish to vote, vote in. Is there objection to cutting the roll call short by any member? Hearing no objection, polls are closed. Clerk will tabulate. A vote of a, 1 to 107. The House non concurs in the Senate amendments, and a message will be sent to the Senate. Clerk will read. Senate amendments to House Bill 3071. This was Mr. Ott's bill, and it was in agriculture. <laughs> Mr. Ott, you want to try to get unanimous consent to take it up now, or you want to print it on the calendar tomorrow? This is the Equine Industry Support Measures Study Committee. Put it on the calendar. You want unanimous consent to take it up. All right. All right. Members, these are, this is Senate amendments to the Equine Industry Support Measure Study Committee. Mr. Ott is asking unanimous consent that the House take the Senate amendments up now to House Bill 3071. Is there an objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Mr. Ott is recognized to explain the Senate amendments. Mr. Ott is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was just conferring with staff. The Senate simply made some, some minor corrections on making sure that the direction that the study committee was going to go in was streamlined, making sure that it was open and inclusive of anything that they wanted to talk about. So, Mr. Speaker, I would recommend that we concur with the Senate amendments. Pending question is concurring to the Senate amendments to House Bill 3071. Mr. Ott recommends that the House concur. Roll calls required in order. You vote green to confer, concur. You vote red to non concur. You'll vote on the board. We got. All right, members, we've got a number of Senate amendments. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read them across and we'll get to them tomorrow. Senate amendments are not affected by the crossover date. All members wish to vote, voted. 
Objection to cutting the roll call short. Does any member object? Hearing no objection, pose the close. Clerk will tabulate. I vote 104 to 3. The House concurs in the Senate amendments to House Bill 3071. Clerk will read. Senate amendments, Mr. Ott, 3549. Senate amendments. <clears throat> okay. Senate amendments, 3770. Morals, Sen Senate amendments. Senate amendments, 3925. Reed Allison. Senate amendments. Intro Excuse me, committee report, judiciary committee reports favorably with amendment 3681, Simmeral. Committee report. <clears throat> Ways and means favorable with amendment 4017, Simmeral. Committee report. Ways and means favorable with amendment 3786, Merle Smith. Committee report. Orangeburg delegation, committee reports favorable 515, Senate. Committee report. House resolution. Shedron Williams commending Christine James. Adopted. Mr. Williams, action and sent to ask for the roll of the House. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted. Second time. Stroma. Representative uh, Mark Smith congratulating Penny Pernalta. Mr. Smith asked you name to sit at the roll of the House. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted. Representative Robinson honoring and commending Zeta Phi Beta Sorority. Ms. Robinson asked you name to sit at the roll of the House. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted. Mr. Anderson, celebrating the life of Thomas Malden Brown, Jr. Mr. Anderson, Ashton Adams, sent that to roll of the House. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Adopted. Gary Smith inviting the South Carolina Independent School Associations to use this chamber at a time to be determined. Mm-hmm. Adopted. Introduction by Mr. Gary Smith, reiterating the General Assembly's well-founded expectation. All right, members, this is um, the concurrent resolution that many of you have asked me about um, wanting it to be placed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 About whether it would be placed on the calendar. The rule, as Mr. Reed has just stated, is it will be placed on the calendar unless there are five objections. Um, again, members have asked about this. It will be placed on the calendar unless there are five objections. Excuse me, it gets immediate consideration unless it's we hear five objections. Mr. Ott, did you Mr. Cobb Honor? I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Mr. I'm gonna get the reading clerk to read it. Okay, dokie. Read the title, Mr. Clark. Yes, sir. This is a concurrent resolution by Gary Smith, Burns, Haddon, and Robinson, reiterating the General Assembly's well founded expectation that the Greenville Health Authority Board of Trustees shall conscientiously and proactively supervise the lessee's compliance with all of its duties and responsibilities enumerated by the master affiliation agreement and the lease and contribution agreement ratified by the General Assembly in Act 274 of 2018. That'll be placed on, placed on the calendar unless five members object. House will be in order. This is, a con this is a concurrent resolution to reiterate the General Assembly's well-founded expectation that the Greenville Health Authority Board of Trustees shall conscientiously and proactively supervise the lessee's compliance 
with all of its duties and responsibilities enumerated in the master affiliation agreement and the lease and contribution agreement ratified by the General Assembly in Act 274 of Act 218. This is what about 30 of you have come up and asked me about and said you wanted to object to it having to it being placed on the calendar. So and asking that it be referred to committee. I, I do not care, I just make the point because you have asked me. So the question becomes, do five members object to it being placed on the calendar? Okay. All right, then it's up to me to send it to a committee. I refer to the House Ways and Means Committee. House Clerk Reed. Yes, sir. House resolution by Representative Car Carter honoring Larry Penley. Representative Carter, Ashton Adams, sent that to the roll of the House. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered to adopt it. And Mr. Pendarv is expressing sorrow for the loss of Gary McJunkin. Pendarvis, Ashton Amson, to add the roll of the House. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered to adopt it. Um, concurrent resolution by El Senor Mika Kasky, Deputy Michael Medlin. Ms. Kasky asks unanimous consent to add the roll of the House. Is there objection? Mm -hmm. Hearing none, so ordered to adopt it. As well as Deputy Kevin Odell. Cassie Ashton Adams to add the roll of the house. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered adopted. And Deputy Gabriel Mulkey. Ms. Cassie Ashton Adams to add the roll of the house. Is there objection? Hearing none, so ordered adopted. Representative McCabe honoring Pelion Elementary School archery team. Adopted. Senate 725 remembers the heroism of Senior Corporal Gary Beaver. Adopted. Senate 2, 731. Senator Fanning, sorrow for the passing of Paul Short. Adopted. Representative Robert Williams, pertaining to minimum wage scales for public school support staff. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Williams, retire, relating to the eligibility of persons who can participate in PTI. For the House Judiciary Committee. Mr. Williams, assault and battery offenses. For the House Judiciary Committee. Williams and Jefferson, the use of mounted, oscillating, rotating, or flashing red lights in records. For the House 3M Committee. Mr. Pendarvis, habitual offender defined. For the House Judiciary Committee. Velveeta Calhoun, the minimum staffing requirements by community residential care facility. For the House LCI Committee. Mr. Herb Kurzman. Livable Homes Tax Credit Act. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Simmel Felder Golf Carts Safety Belt Requirements Seating Requirements and Penalties. For the House Judiciary Committee. Hickson Unlawful Trade Practice to make a bad assertion of copyright infringement. For the House Judiciary Committee. Aye. Prohibiting public utilities from taking adverse employment actions against employees in legal matters. For the House Judiciary Committee. Brandon Newton establishing a 14-day period preceding a general election during which qualified electors may be allowed to cast early for the House Judiciary Committee. 
Simmeral, annual vehicle registration, license fees. For Dallas Education Committee. Ms. Allison, teacher preparation programs. For Dallas Judiciary Committee. Ms. Trantham and many others. Yes, sir. Clerk Reed. Ms. Trantham and many others enacting the Save Women's Sports Act. For the House Judiciary Committee. Robert Williams, inmates, employment, Department of Correction requirements. For the House Judiciary Committee. Robert Williams, motor sales, motor fuel outlets. For Dallas LCI committee. Robert Williams, providing that members of the General Assembly may use athletic clubs or gymnasiums owned by state agencies, entities. For Dallas Judiciary Committee. Robert Williams, Sexual Assault Survivors Bill of Rights. For the House Judiciary Committee. Robert Williams, possessions of firearms and rifles. For the House Judiciary Committee. Robert Williams, train limitations blocking four lane intersections in municipalities and penalties. For the House Judiciary Committee. Robert Williams, public utilities, natural gas. For the House LCI Committee. Representative Bannister relating to gaming machines prohibited by law. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Fry and many others relating to forms of absentee ballot applications requiring voters' date of birth and voters' driver's license. For the House Judiciary Committee. Representative Dabney, Kershaw County and Services of the Health Service Department in Kershaw. For the Kershaw delegation. Mr. Rivers, natural gas, exemptions for rate payers. For the House LCI committee. Senate introduction, Senate 40. Parking facilities. Highway facility. For the House Education Committee. Senate 154. Collection and enforcement of taxes. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Senate 195. Issuance of tax notices. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Senate 227. Massage Therapy Practice Act. For Dallas 3M Committee. We have Senate 236, Young. Voting precincts in municipal elections and numbers required for individual precincts. For Dallas Judiciary Committee. 243 is a Senate introduction for the unfounded child abuse and neglect reports. For Dallas Judiciary Committee. Senate 296, Motor Vehicles. Issuance of golf cart permits. For the House Education Committee. Senate 304. Persons or corporations using electric vehicle charging stations and regulation. For the House LCI Committee. Senate 495. Department of Insurance. Limited lines of travel. For the House LCI Committee. Senate 455, licensure of nurses. For the House 3M Committee. 456, state finger 
print background checks. For the House Judiciary Committee. Senate 461, South Carolina Pay for Success Performance Accountability Act. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Senate 463, Tax Credits, Geothermal Machinery and Equipment. For the House Ways and Means Committee. 503, Medical Acts, the Advanced Practice Registered Nurses may perform. For the House 3M Committee. Senate 556. Commercial licenses for people trapping fur-bearing animals. For the House Agriculture Committee. Senate 615. Participation in interscholastic activities in public schools. For the House Education Committee. Senate 627, income tax rates pass through business income. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Senate 631, notaries public acknowledgments, restrictions. For the House Judiciary Committee. 667, relocation and adjustment of signs by the Department of Transportation. For the House Education Committee. 689, extending income tax filing dates. For the House Ways and Means Committee. 698, receipts for guarantee funds to pay cotton producer claims. Mm. Mr. Moss, for what purpose do you rise? Okay. You, you can ask it to go without reference, Mr. Moss. Is that what you want to do? Um, come up, if you would, explain what the bill does. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is a joint resolution that addresses cotton farmer losses totaling around $1.8 million. We had a, uh, a cotton gin which took their cotton and sold it and can't come up with the money to pay the cotton growers. Uh, so they don't have the money to plant their crops this spring. There was a fund set up in the 1960s that was the cotton growers paid two or three cents per pound into this fund. It had a cap of three million, never been used. And since then, interest has grown to 1.7 million. And we want to use the interest to make these, to get to the farmers, it'll be administered to the Department of Agriculture so they can get their crops in the ground. And what we understand, SLED and the Department of Agriculture are going to thoroughly investigate this, try to and find out what happened. Mr. Moss, this is using interest from the warehouse receipt guarantee fund to pay these. Mr. McKnight, this is what you are asking about. Um, is there any objection to this bill going without reference for these few farmers? Hearing none, be printed on the calendar tomorrow. Clerk will read. 704. This bill pertains to in-person classroom instruction members of the retirement system. For the House Ways and Means Committee. Okay. Mr. Kirby, for what purpose do you rise, sir? House will be in order. Members. Mr. Kirby's got a very special adjourned in memory and he's recognized. Mr. Kirby. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's my honor today to uh, tell you about a lady who was very special to many of us in the Lake City area. Miss Lorraine Lizenhart Moore, 89, passed away on Thursday, April 1st, 2020. Mrs. Moore is survived by two daughters, Lisa G. Moore of Daniel Island and our esteemed philanthropist, Darla D. Moore of Lake City. She survived by his grandsons, David Allen Galanka of Stuttgart, Germany, William Joseph Galanda of Boston, Massachusetts, and others. 
She's a longtime member of the choir of the Lake City United Methodist Church, dedicated to her church and to her community. She was the office administrator at the Lake City United Methodist Church for 25 years, also serving on the administrative board and the finance committee. She was a volunteer for the Lake City Public Library, Lake City Community Hospital, and Meals on Wheels. In fact, she was delivering Meals on Wheels to the homebound in Lake City only a few weeks before her death. She was a beautiful and graceful woman. She instilled her generous and giving spirit and care for her community throughout her family. The Lake City community and the state of South Carolina will miss her, but her generous spirit lives on through the service of her children to their community, state, and nation. Mr. Speaker, I request that when the South Carolina House adjourn today, it do so in memory and honor of the life and lasting influence of Ms. Lorraine Lisenhart Moore of Lake City, South Carolina. And I further request that these comments be entered into the journal of the South Carolina House of Representatives. Okay. Mr. Kirby requests that when the House adjourn today, that it adjourn in memory of Mrs. Lorraine Moore and that request is certainly honored, Mr. Kirby, with our condolences. Mr. Kirby also requests that his comments be allowed to be placed in the record, and certainly we, um, we encourage that, Mr. Kirby. Thank you for those comments. For a wonderful lady, a life well lived. Um, before we adjourn today, announcements. Agricultural Fool and Subcommittee is canceled today. Any other announcements for the good of the body? Mr. Govan? Sir, Mr. Govan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Members of the House, I know the hour is late. And so I won't prolong this, but I just wanted to take this opportunity um, to let you know that on Saturday, uh, April 3rd, we laid to rest my niece uh, and someone who I considered and raised like a daughter, Letitia, this is Letitia Moore. Uh, on Saturday at 1 o'clock at Simmons Funeral Chapel. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to just share with you very briefly. It was a beautiful service, a beautiful home going. The family, like many of you, um, some who are willing to share have lost loved ones as a result of this. I don't mind publicly saying that Letitia lost her battle, a very short battle, as a result of COVID-19. The girls, she had four children and some beloved sisters. And earlier, uh, not just two years ago, three years ago, they lost their mother, my sister. So this family, the circle has really grown very small on that side of the family. But I wanted to just share this with you because it touched my heart and I'm so proud of the way they are handling it uh, as the patriarch of the family. They said to Tisha, our sister, our Titi, our mama, our daughter, <coughs> our niece, our friend, your passing has left a void in our hearts that can never be filled. We just weren't ready to say goodbye it seems so unfair, especially when you had just found your happy. You persevered through the letdowns, you pushed past the disappointments and everything was falling into place. We never know why things happen the way they do, but what we do know is that God always has a plan. Stars always shine brightest before they fade away. You fought the good fight, you finished the race, you kept the faith and now your crown awaits we love you and will forever cherish 
your memories. I wanted to share that with you because, ladies and gentlemen, we get caught up into the hustle and bustle up here, and sometimes we take for granted that life for tomorrow is not always promised. We sometimes are so busy trying to be successful or be engaged in other things, we forget to take time to laugh, love, and enjoy one another. And that's why it's so important that even amongst ourselves, as we do the business of this state, that we not take each other for granted and that we remember that all of this is temporary. From the time that we were born, it was meant that we also have an end. And I wanted to share that with you from the heart because there are over six, close to 600,000 Americans, uh, individuals that lived the life and loved that have now gone on. Their lives have been cut short and they're not here anymore. And it doesn't matter whether you're black or white, red, blue or green, doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, I doubt very seriously whether there's been, not been anyone in this chamber whose life has not been touched by COVID. So I just wanted to take this moment to encourage you. And I said some things, and hopefully it got to you, Mr. Speaker, that we not take this COVID-19 for granted. The battle is not over. We cannot yet claim the victory. And that this evil monster that has crept not through only through this country, but across this world, is still taking lives and still taking loved ones. And that we should not take it for granted. And so having said that, I want to say on behalf of the family for all of your, your cards, uh, phone calls, text messages, and other expressions of kindness that you showed my family and myself during this hour of our loss, unexpected loss. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. And from the bottom of our heart, we encourage you, we extol upon you, we beg of you, don't take it for granted. Take the time and make things right and be safe. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Govan. The thoughts and prayers of the entire house go out to you. Govan family and the Moore family, and I would ask that the house stand just for a moment in silent prayer in memory of Ms. Moore and in prayerful respect to the families. Amen. Thank you, Ms. Govan. Any other announcements for the good of the body? Mr. Britton, in honor of his birthday, excuse me, before I do that, um, agriculture full and subcommittee have been canceled today. There is an early childhood subcommittee meeting at 9 a.m. in the morning. Any other? At 4? Early childhood subcommittee meeting, fourth floor, 9 a.m. in the morning. Mr. Morgan? Transportation at 9 in the morning, 4th floor. Transportation subcommittee, the education committee at 9 o'clock in the morning on the 4th floor. Mr. Breton, in honor of his birthday, moves that the House do now adjourn to meet at 10 a.m. tomorrow. All in favor say aye. Opposed no.